Vale, perfecto. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Mobile Social Congress 2022, a project by the City Council of Barcelona. You can also find us with a hashtag and our website. For those of you who are online, our session is being recorded. If you have any questions, you can ask them in the chat. My name is Elena. I am a journalist critic. I will be guiding in the different panels for this Mobile Social Congress 2023. I will give you a small context. Mobile Social Congress is a project that is trying to create a space for reflection and gathering for technologies, information, communication, and the production models. In this eight edition, our motto is we are activating the fair and sustainable technology. We will have enough for different issues regarding environmental issues and working issues. Our speakers today have interpreting into English and Spanish. You can choose the language you want to use. I can open yourselves to that language. For those who are following us online, don't disconnect, don't uh, go away after the pause. There will be a pause at 7 p.m. Today's welcome will be by Lizar and Claudia Bosch, the Lizar from the Council of Barcelona, Claudia Bosch from CETEM, Barcelona. You have the floor, David. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. So we'll turn our phones off too, alarms off, etc. So hello to you. Here we are opening a new edition of the Social Mobile Congress. Always, in the context is one of the biggest gatherings in the world, in the world of electronics, representatives of states, technological powers, and companies are showing their latest innovations, showing whoever has the latest technologies, and they make big business in a context where there's between 80 and 100,000 people from around the world. Even if a lot of Chinese are not coming because of the COVID limitations. And this has a lot to do with Barcelona branding of the fourth ecosystem in Europe of digital startups. So obviously, when one comes into a space like this and one sees the whole dimension of the business of this progress towards the future, we wonder about what could happen in our lives and our workplaces and in our jobs. But there's a space for discussion that is not very visible. It's quite minimized. In this world conference, which is everything that has to do with a series of actors that are outside of the privileged supply chain pieces, those working in the mines, those working in the plants, the key people for this, those who are living in the transit places for the electronic industry. And these are numbers of 
the pe- number of people dedicated to this are much bigger than the people gathered in the World Mobile Congress. The Botafumeiro, a well-known restaurant in Barcelona, has registered expenses per person up to 6,000 euro. I don't know if any of you has ever spent 6,000 euro for a meal at a restaurant. And just to show you that this is what's happening at the vortex or at the tip of this pyramid. It's important to reflect about this and what's happening and what's behind all of this. So we thank Setem for having organized this conference. Barcelona has a global justice policy. And Barcelona wants to work for global justice based, based on two premises. The first, the world is working in an unjust way, especially in the world of electronics. And the second premise, or the second principle on which we're basing, we're basing ourselves to work on this, is that in the context of complex problems, migrations, refugees, these have a shared responsibility. Barcelona has a part She shares a part of this responsibility. Barcelona as consumer of products or the citizens of Barcelona using energy from Russia and the Ukraine has to also take responsibility in its public policies for these things, its own part of the responsibility. So this is an obligation for us We got together with our colleagues from Pharma Mundi, with whom we had financed a program in Africa. In Rwanda, is blooming economically, but Goma, a city next to it, is about to explode because There are guerrillas, murders of hundreds of people every day. A fourth of the population can be killed in a few days. And this is happening every day. And the blue helmets are there. All of this has to do with electronics because, as you know, the regional geopolitics has to do with the exploitation of minerals, with the growth by some economic powers, among which is the European Union, European Union, which has decided to do a digital and ecological transition, which also requires solar panels and a digital revolution, which creates a great demand from the Congo or the Philippines in their minds. which creates a series of injustices in these countries. Electronics are leading the unjust supply chains, so they need to be analyzed, then we need to put our focus on them. So I think this is a good thing to do. Television. Speaking about the World Congress, the Mobile World Congress every day on the news, so it's important for us to place the focus also on what is behind it. We are carrying out projects of cooperation with Bogota, Tunisia, and many other countries. But we also want to help denounce the violations of human rights of peoples like the Uyghurs, and that have to do with business and public procurement. Carla, an expert of public procurement and human rights, and Laura from Electronics Watch, 
are working on this, there are NGOs that know about transnational knowledge, and there's trade unions in Singapore or the Philippines. We are working together with all of them to generate a new governance on electronics and to bring forward new procedures of purchase. So when we hear about a human rights violation, because a Singapore or Malaysia worker tells us about it, then we tell the buyers, the purchasers, we inform the buyers about what's happening, and thus we generate a movement of global justice, a counter movement, which is contrary to trying to make prices cheaper and cheaper, which is the main cause that is causing human rights violations. So, we are learning a lot from all the administrations. We're trying to learn from Oslo, Sweden, and other countries in the north of Europe regarding public procurement. We're working with our NGOs and the whole community, and we are only halfway. The City Council of Barcelona is still buying from companies that are violating human rights. Florentino Ferrovial is in the media right now. Or IBM, which is now Lenovo, right? Anyway, I wish you a good social mobile congress. Thanks for organizing this. Satem will keep on being a pain in the neck. Thank you, David. We'll give the floor to Claudio Vos, the technician of this campaign. Just um, technology. I would like to respect the time of the speakers, so I won't take much time. I'd like to present Judith, who's here bes beside me, my colleague from CETEM, responsible of the Just Electronic Campaign, and one of my mentors as well. I would like to tell you a little bit about the way in which CETEM ended up doing what we're doing. CETEM has a history of 150 years. It's a non-profit organization. CETEM used to work overseas, abroad, until we realized it was more important to revise and study what we are doing here and how we are relating to those realities from here locally. We have collaborations with Centre de Las regarding disarmament. This is the seventh year we're organizing this conference. And unfortunately, this is a very necessary conference. Mobile World Con the Mobile World Congress is at the limelight, which opens a window for us to make this impact vis visible. Uh, the things we're trying to announce all year long. I would like to thank Diaz Agost, who's helping us publish many interviews and spread the message. Thank you for being here. I would like to tell you that this is just the tip of the iceberg. Starting from here, we'll be collaborating more strongly with other agents trying to work alongside with the Global South. The Social Mobile Congress is still alive. We hope it will be a very useful platform to denounce the impacts that have to do with the electronic industry supply chain. We have tried to cover the whole chain from the mineral extraction or extraction uh, to the mines to the end of life, so that the whole procedure can be covered. We have tried to bring as many critical voices as possible that may help us understand the complexity behind the supply chains. I have the impression that when thinking about technology, what comes to mind is future, innovation, progress, intangible things, but we need to become aware that all of this technology 
depends on a very important material base, which is not an abstract thing or an intangible thing. There are people behind this, so this is why we've come today. We're going to place these people here. Um, as speakers, and we'll give them a microphone so they can be seen. Thanks to both of you, David and Claudia. Before we proceed with the first panel, I would like to inform you that at the entrance, you will find information on the participation against the initiative of Las Navas presented by the association known to the mine Cañaraveral. So we would like to join the delegations. You can find information about the project at the entrance of the room now. After this introduction, you can also tweet. Um, hashtag NSC2023 or hashtag CDM. And now we'll give the floor our, to our representatives from the Philippines, a country which has become a great exporter of electronic components, but it has also become the scenario of great violations of human rights and work rights violations. We have the moderation by Marta Rivera, the Nation of Justice of the Desk Observatory, an expert in law and economy, as well as sociology. I will leave you then with this first panel on the Philippines and the electronic industry. My name is Marta Rivera. I work for the observatory desk. We also work carrying out analysis of the impact of the social and environmental impacts of different industries. We're working so that transnational companies will take responsibility for the violations of human rights and working rights that are happening all alongside the supply chain. For those interested in violations of human rights violations and environmental rights violations. Next week, we'll be presenting a report on the impacts of the platform economies, companies like Globo, Uber, or Amazon, and the Lleialtat Sansenka. However, you're not here to listen to me, but to listen to this great panel that will be extremely inspiring for sure. And with us, we have Camps de Ligente, Nadia de León and Sarina Musni. I will give the floor to Camps de Ligente, working at the Center Trade Union and Human Rights. She will be joining us online, I think. Is she already online? Or are we, sorry, or are we starting with Sarina? Sarina Musni is a lawyer of human rights and a defender of human rights. She's here to explain different cases on which she's been working in the Philippines, defending also activist defenders of human rights. She's a member of trade unions as a lawyer, and she's collaborating with the Catalan Association for Peace. So you have the floor, Sarina. Good afternoon. First of all, thank you very much for uh, this space that you have invited us to share the situation of human rights in the Philippines, in particular to workers' rights, in particular to the electronics industry, and going further to the source of all these electronics that are in the mountains of the Philippine Islands. Thank you very much for this time. But for us, if I'm not mistaken from our discussion with Claudia, for all of us to understand uh, the situation first of the workers' rights in the electronics industry in the Philippines, perhaps my two colleagues would be better to start off the discussion. In the communications, I think it's first from the CTUHR, 
from the Center okay. Trade Union, so she can give us uh, the particular incidents in this field. Then second, no? Sí, exactamente. Ha fet, crec que ja les tenim preparades, les dues companyes. I think the two speakers are ready. Uh, they are going to be virtually, so we are going to give the floor to Kams Deligenti. He is director of Center for Trade Union and Human Rights, as it's been said, and he's uh, been in charge also of the communication and education department of uh, the organization. He is uh, dedicated to the raising awareness of the situation of uh, union people in the Philippines and creating training for uh, the people working in the electronic sector and trade unionists. And she's going to tell about, about the working conditions of people working in the electronic sector in the Philippines. So the floor is yours, Mrs. Deligente. On. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear All right. you. All right. I'll share my slides, please. Uh, yeah, we, uh, from the Center for Trade Rights, uh, we thank Setem Catalunya for giving us the space to uh of workers in the electronic sector in the Philippines. Sembla que escoltem la traducció simultània, però no al directe. We can hear can the interpretation, share? but not the original. Can I share okay. my slides? Um, We cannot hear you in the room. If you comes, if you could wait for a few minutes uh, or one minute, right. so we rearrange the situation so you could be heard live in the room. All right. Gracias. Can you talk again? Can you talk again, please? Hello. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, hello? You can hear me now. Hello? Hello? <laughs> yes, please go yes. on. All right. Uh, can someone please share my slides? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Perdoneu, eh? Esto es un poco complicado. Uh, again, we thank Setem Cataluña for inviting and uh, giving us this opportunity uh, to share the situation of workers in the electronic sector in the Philippines. Uh, so I'm, I'm, my task is to give an overview of the situation of workers in the electronics industry in the Philippines uh, based on our work uh, uh, in, as a monitoring partner of the Electronics Watch and also a partner of local unions and networks of uh, electronics workers. So this is just a quick overview of uh, how the electronics industry remains to be uh, the Philippines' top export uh, and driver of economic growth. Uh, the industry is highly export-oriented and dominated by multinational companies. Here are just some uh, figures. In November 2022, uh, the electronics uh, com comprise 64.3% of Philippines' total exports, uh, and it amounted to $4.57 billion only for that month. Uh, and in 2021, uh, the total exports are worth $45.92 billion in the electronics sector. Next slide, please. In terms of employment, uh, based on the data of the in 2018, the industry employed 3.2 million direct and indirect workers. Uh, more than 60% of this are women workers. Uh, 
as we all know, women are still uh, preferred by electronic countries, uh, manu manufacturing companies because of their uh, distinct characteristics of being more detailed and uh, better, they have better dexterity. Next slide, please. Uh, CTOHR conducted a risk assessment research with the help of, with the support of Electronics Watch in 2016. Uh, and we found uh, some major issues faced by workers uh, in the sector. Uh, here are some uh, low wages, lack of job security, uh, forced overtime, poor working conditions, and violations against freedom of association. Next slide, please. Yeah, in terms of wages in the Philippines continue to be insufficient to sustain the basic needs of Filipino families. Uh, right now, the clamor for wage increase and the demand for uh, the return of the national minimum wage has been increasing, especially this past year, due to the soaring prices of commodities. Uh, the Filipino families can barely survive with the low wages that we've been receiving. Uh, family living wage for a family of five is pegged at $21 by Ebon Foundation. However, the daily minimum wage the highest in the national capital region is only $10.4. Uh, it barely reaches the 50% of amount for a family to survive. Uh, those in the regions where uh, most electronic companies prefer to, to be located are uh, have lower wages. Uh, the lowest Philippines is at $6.4 in uh, Region 13. Next slide, please. Sorry. Yeah, so in our research in 2016, uh, but we have also monitored the continues to date, uh, workers reported uh, mandatory overtime without the legally required rest day a condition for continued employment or contract renewal, uh, which is a risk factor for, force, for forced lab labor. Um, uh, recently, uh, the Philippines has been trying to implement a uh, uh, four-day work week. So the workers tend to work more hours uh, having no time of enough rest and, rec and recreation and time for family. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, and there's also lack of job security, although the government claims that 70% of the workers in the sector are under regular employment. It does say if these are from the direct and in the and indirect employees or only from the direct employees, which only comprise three hundred thousand to five hundred thousand workers, uh, we have monitored that contractual employees in the sector lack social protection and security of tenure. They they have been especially vulnerable during the pandemic because they uh, they do not have the uh, they do not have health care and protection that could like that could help them uh support during the pandemic uh some workers report and termination are used as disciplinary tools when workers are absent due to overwork and fatigue or to punish those who join or seek to organize a union. In the Philippines, although it is not really uh, stated in the laws that contract workers cannot join unions, uh, that is the uh, widely accepted uh, system that only regular employees uh, have the freedom to join and uh, form unions. So that's one of the main problems of uh, the dominance of uh, contractual employees 
in the Philippines. Next slide, please. And uh, one major problem in the sector is the violation against freedom of association. Uh, trade unions are virtually absent in the industry as the indus industry organization, say P notes, typically companies are non-unionized. Non uh, several factors uh, hinder the workers to join or form unions. Uh, one, one of them is extensive employment of contractual workers with no job security who hold that they may not join or organize trade unions. Uh, uh, this sometimes are in, in the form of written contracts or in uh, verbal orientations by management and even the PESA authority. The location of companies in special economic zones for unwritten, no union, no, no strike policy is enforced by both the state and the corporate sector. Most of the electronic companies in the Philippines are located in special economic zones, which, which has uh, somehow uh, different laws where uh, companies are favored more and receive more perks and uh, benefits. So one of this is the promise of uh, industrial independence, thus the no union, no strike policy. So uh, workers in these areas really have a hard time uh, organizing unions because there's uh, uh, strict security measures and uh, yeah, workers are hindered to form or join unions or do uh, social actions in these areas. Next slide, please. Yeah, another form of violation against freedom of association that we have monitored, uh, especially uh, the, this during the pandemic, is uh, the campaign of state forces in the in the form task force to end local communist armed conflict. They hound unionists in their homes and force them to disaffiliate from their unions. Uh, one of the most targeted uh, is the Nexperia Philippines Workers Incorporated Union. Uh, it is a union in a multinational electronics manufacturing company. Uh, the union is already has turned 40 years old in December. Uh, but State forces still continue to tag them and uh, uh, brand them as terrorists and harass and threaten the workers and the leaders, the union leaders, that they should disaffiliate from uh, their union or else they will be put in watch list. Uh, they are also being threatened that they will be arrested due to violation of anti-terrorism law. So things like this happen in uh, areas where, where there is a concentration of uh, unions. Uh, it mostly happens in Laguna, in Mindanao, in Cavite. Uh, it, it is, uh, it is uh, a sad fact that... Uh, the state forces are the ones doing this against the unions. And recently, uh, we had the ILO high-level high level tripartite mission in the Philippines. And these are some of the issues that we raised uh, and some of the issues that uh, alarms the workers in the unions that they do not enjoy their exercise of freedom of association in the Philippines. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, I'm. I am all, almost on my last slides. Uh, yeah, the one the the Philippines remains to be one of the most dangerous countries for workers, according to the International Trade Union Confederation. Uh, in 2021, uh, Dandy Miguel, a president of Fuji Electric Philippines uh, Workers Union, was murdered on his way home uh, from work. Uh, he's a very young union leader. And uh, yeah, he, uh, he was the last uh, victim of extrajudicial killings under the Duterte government. And now there's there's still no justice for him and for 60 plus other victims of uh, extrajudicial killings among workers and unionists. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, 
yeah, uh, I would end my presentation with these photos that despite these challenges, despite the threats to the lives of workers, uh, they still strive to uh, fight for their rights and uh, continue to form unions for the uh, betterment of the working conditions and the dignity of the workers in the Philippines. Thank you so much. Muchísimas gracias, Cam. Thank you very much, Cams. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you. Hola. Hola, hola. Sí, ahora. Don't, ahora sí. As I was saying, thank you very much, Cams uh, Deligente, for this global vision on the working condition of people working in the Philippines in the electronic sector. CAMS has told us that uh, conditions are precarious, that uh, the freedom of association is violated or the freedom to become part of the, to unionize. And before going into the debate on what companies could do in order to improve these situations, we're going to hear uh, our second panelist. She's been working on uh, safety and security conditions on workers in the electronic sector and what uh, their access to health plans. And this is why we have with us Nadia De Leon. She is director of the Institute for Occupational Health and Safety Development in the Philippines. And before being the director of this institution, she worked as a union organizer before also taking up the position of advocacy officer in this organization in 2012. So to talk about all these subjects, we have with us Nadia De Leon. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear okay, you. Okay, I'm Nadia. going to share my screen. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nadja De Leon from the Institute for Occupational Health and Safety Development, or ISAT Philippines. First, uh, we would like to thank SETEM for inviting us to share about uh, our general work on occupational safety and health in the Philippines, and also to share uh, some highlights of our specific work on the health and uh, safety rights of uh, electron uh, workers in the electronics industry. Okay, uh, IUSED's main goal is to protect and uphold the workers' OSHA rights. We also assist the workers in designing their own OSH programs. Our, uh, we do research, education and training, medical services, campaign and advocacy, and we also organize occupational disease and accidents victims. Um, we, uh, together with uh, labor unions and other institutions, uh, worked for the legislation of the new Occupational Safety and Health Law, which was approved last 2018. We welcome uh, ILO's um, recognition of occupational safety and health as a fundamental principle and right at work. Recognizing OSH as a fundamental right is also a challenge to us, uh, especially to unions and OSH groups like IUSAD. Uh, we should ensure OSH programs are always included in our plans of actions and movements. We were able to include this uh, essential occupational safety and health rights in the new OSH law that was passed in 2018. Uh, workers' right to know, right to refuse and safe work, right to report accidents, and the right to be provided free and appropriate personal protective equipment. Besides these four basic OSH rights, the new OSH law also included important provisions on labor inspection, 
company's duty is to provide OSH programs, personnel, and uh, uh, workers' welfare facilities. It also outlined uh, the workers' duties uh, and their inclusion in the occupational safety and health committees that are required to be established in every workplace. Uh, we consider the passage of the Occupational Safety and Health Law in the Philippines in 2018 a positive step, uh, a significant gain of the workers' uh, struggle for occupational safety and health rights. But we should uh, also note that this law rejected our demand to criminalize cross OSH standards violations that resulted in workers' injuries and deaths. Besides the OSH law, um, the Mental Health Act was also passed in 2018. Workplaces should implement mental health policies and programs. This includes increasing workers' awareness in mental health and implementation of non-discriminatory policies in the workplace. Uh, the following year, uh, the expanded maternity leave law was passed uh, in the Philippines and entitled Women Workers 205 Paid Days from the Previous 60 Days. With all these laws in place, can uh, we say that Filipino workers are already safe? In the Philippines, thousands of workers still get injured due to workplace accidents. Workers still suffer from work-related diseases. Worse, hundreds of workers are still dying due to unsafe work. Five years since the OSH law was enacted, it is alarming to know that we still see workplace deaths that are preventable. Last year, 2022, in just six weeks between May to July, we recorded 12 workplace deaths. Uh, based on the 2019-2020 government data, occupational injuries that resulted in workers' deaths have reached 310. Moreover, uh, it should be noted that uh, this does not uh, reflect the entire picture uh, because workers' deaths due to occupational diseases are not clearly represented in this data. Moreover, the government can only cover uh, a small amount or percentage of establishments uh, because of lack of labor inspectors. Workers' health became more vulnerable during the pandemic. The OSH law did not uh, provide significant assistance to workers' protection. Many guidelines by the government also failed to protect the workers from COVID-19. COVID outbreaks occurred in the workplaces. Big multinational electronic companies that are supposedly compliant with OSH and are considered quote unquote uh, clean industries also failed to protect their workers from COVID-19. Almost 1,000 employees of an, of an electronics company in a special economic zone suffered from COVID-19 where three workers also died. The no work, no pay policy forced the workers to choose between their livelihood and their health. This unfair policy was one of the main factors that caused the COVID outbreaks in workplaces. Uh, even before the pandemic, uh, IOSAD has been consistently working with uh, unions in the electronics industry. In 2019, the manufacturing industry had the highest number of occupational injuries and diseases. Last year, 2022, we conducted a workshop on OSH in the electronics industry. We gathered the most urgent OSH issues and concerns shared by the workers during the workshop. Workers have expressed their concern on their continued exposure to chemicals in their workplaces. Some workers are alarmed that their right to know uh, these chemicals is violated. They know the names of these chemicals, but are unaware of the short or the potential short and long-term effects uh, these chemicals can uh, do to their health. Uh, they also reported uh, the lack or absence of appropriate 
personal protective equipment. Besides exposure to chemicals, workers in the electronics industry also face ergonomical hazards. They stand for long periods of time and do repetitive work. It is also alarming that this, uh, there are still companies who do not comply with the OSH law in terms of establishing mandatory occupational safety and health committees. The workers also share that uh, they are not aware of the government's compensation program where workers who suffer from work-related injuries should be uh, are entitled to benefits and compensation. These accounts only show that the fight for safe and uh, healthy workplaces continues. In our view, the culture of neglect in OSH among employers persists due to the absence of strict penalties for OSH standards violations. Employers who commit gross OSH violations that claimed workers' lives, such as in the case of the Kentex workplace uh, that killed more than 70 workers in 2015, remain free and were not made accountable. Based on the OSH law, Non-compliant employers are only liable for an administrative fine not exceeding 100,000 pesos or uh, approximately 1,800 US dollars. We have filed a proposed bill that seeks to criminalize OSH standards violations where gross violators shall be imposed with stricter penalties like higher fines with imprisonment. Besides our campaign for OSH law amendments, we have also outlined our plans to conduct research on the health and working conditions of workers in the electronics and chemicals industry in the coming years. We have an ongoing partnership with six unions that are part of the newly formed Workers in the Semiconductors and Electronics Network or WISE Network here in the Philippines. They represented. Uh, they represent more or less 10,000 workers in the industry. We will work together uh, to gather essential data, and uh, we plan to use these studies to push for rele uh, relevant uh, OSH guidelines in the sectors. Uh, in a 2015 research, uh, 50 women workers out of 200 surveyed had to take at least one leave of absence from work because of various reproductive health issues, uh, such as ovarian cysts, uh, dyspineuria, and uh, urinary tract infections. Uh, the, during the pandemic, uh, we had an ongoing, uh, we have an ongoing partnership with a health NGO in the Philippines where we conduct cervical cancer awareness and screening among women workers. We are studying to push for the inclusion of cerv uh, cervical cancer awareness and other reproductive health programs to be part of the mandatory OSH programs for all companies that should be monitored by the government. I said together with our partner, Metal Workers Alliance of the Philippines and uh, uh, Good Electronics, uh, I was able to produce a module uh, on how to build worker-led occupational safety and health committee. Uh, this was released uh, during the pandemic, and it was also uh, during the pandemic that we had so our first workshop. Uh, with electronics uh, workers in the electronic sectors as our uh, audience. Uh, we also encourage the unions to reach out to other unions by identifying OSH issues and encouraging them to form committees. And eventually these committees could uh, turn into labor unions. Uh, lastly, IUSAT believes that OSH is an effective uh, mobilizing and organizing tool for the workers. We also stand with the workers in asserting that unionized workplaces are safer workplaces. So uh, we declare that occupational safety and health is a right and we demand safe workplaces now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nadia de Leon, for your 
presentation speeches like Nadia's, people who are telling us what they're doing in the Philippines to improve the conditions of workers in the Philippines reminds me of how important it is for us to work alongside with the local organizations in those countries. We are carrying out our work here and they are carrying out advocacy so that laws will be a applied and also they are carrying out trainings and workshops with the workers so that they will raise awareness about the fact. So we are working alongside the North and South together and also this great capacity of denouncing the conditions in which these workers are extracting the minerals and what they are working in the factories, in the companies. We have Sarina Musni with us, a lawyer and defender of human rights, and she's coming to explain her experience regarding different cases that she's been working with in the Philippines with defenders. It's, I think, especially important to remember that defenders of human rights are denouncing violations happening all around the world, and they are still suffering attacks, such as threats, physical attacks, and even murders, like the case that our colleague Nadia was telling us about this task of denouncing these violations is becoming increasingly dangerous in countries such as the Philippines. I think the Philippines is in the is, is the country is, is is among the top ten countries where defenders of human rights are being victims of attacks, aggressions, and murders. So it's important to know that these people are denouncing these human rights relations and they're being the object of attacks because of it and threats. So thank you, Serena, for being here. And uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much also for uh, listening to our stories and being with us here and now to form solidarity, not only with the workers, not only with the lawyers, but also with indigenous peoples who are ultimately one of the um, harmest people or communities all involved in this electronics industry. So, Montes uh, I would like to thank my colleagues, Kams and Nadi, for presenting you the situation of the workers in the Philippines insofar as the electronics industry is concerned. As you can see, the issues of workers are centered in almost two cases. The contractualization of workers or the non-regularization of workers. And two, the exercise of their freedom of association or the right to form or join unions two of the most important rights of a worker, whether you are in the electronics industry or whatever industry you might belong to. Now in the Philippines, these two rights are very much in live action. Perhaps Cam has shown us photos where workers are protesting or giving placards for the demand of um, higher wages, or when Nad Nadia presented uh, workers demanding for more safety precautions during the COVID pandemic. So the workers' movement, workers' rights movement, is very much active in the Philippines. However, workers' rights advocates, as much as any human rights advocate in the Philippines, are facing this phenomenon of red tagging in the Philippines. And this I would like, I will try to be as brief as possible to present to you what is this red tagging in so far also as the anti-tire law is concerned. Well done. Ah, okay. 
Yes, Esto, red tagging. What is this red tagging? In the case of Zarate versus Aquino, that is decided by the Supreme Court, a dissenting opinion of Associate Supreme Justice Marvick Lunen described or defined this phenomenon to be, as I quote, the phenomenon of implicating progressive civil group leaders to heinous crimes is called red baiting, or now we call them red tagging. It is the vilification, labeling, or guilt by association of various democratic organizations. These groups are stereotyped or caricatured by the military as communist groups, making them easy targets of government military or paramilitary units. Very broad. In essence, red tagging, target, targeting, tagging, labeling, naming anyone of a member, a leader, of a civil progressive organization as a communist. And we all know a communist is known to be the Reds, so red tagging. But is this dangerous? We shall see. The Commission of Human Rights in the Philippines has also described this phenomenon as an act of state actors, particularly law enforcement agencies, to publicly brand individuals, groups, or institutions as affiliated to communist or leftist terrorists. Act of state actors, publicly brand, affiliated to communist terrorists. One of the members of our lawyers organization, National Union of People's Lawyers, by the name of attorney Carlo Gillian, he has also analyzed this phenomenon of red tagging to be a mechanism that is engaged by the government of the Philippines to smear, discredit, incite violence, and hate against critics and members of the opposition, particularly from the ranks of activists, progressive groups, and critics of the oppressive and anti-people policies of the then, probably now, of course, Duterte and now the Marcos administration. Because this practice of red tagging, mind you, has been in existence for in the past. But in the Duterte administration, this has been intensified even more. And this being continued now under the Marcos Jr. administration. We've mentioned that it's a public vilification. It's a public branding. And what does this look like? Like this. Tarpaulins bearing your name, your organization as terrorist. Vandalisms on the wall stating that you are an NPA. NPA stands for the New People's Army. The New People's Army is the armed wing of the Communist Party of the Philippines. So if you could see the vandalism on the wall, it is a mathematical or alphanumerical alpha mathematical situ uh, equation, Musni, my family, being a family of human rights defenders and human rights lawyers, Musni plus Zarate, also a human rights lawyer and a congressista, plus Tabacon, a public school teacher, advocates for public school teachers' rights. All these three you add together equals the New People's Army, meaning all of us being lawyers, public school teachers advocating for our rights are armed combatants. That's what it says. It can also be in the form of further tarpaulins where the uh, names of the organizations are being shown to be uh, organizations against democracy or enemies of the government, kalaban sa gobyerno, all these. All these organizations are civil and progressive organizations fighting and asserting democratic and nationalist aspirations for the country. All this too, Bayan Muna, Act Teachers, Gabriela, these are party list organizations who are engaged in elections for seats or, or seats in the House of Congress. 
So they are in the electoral process. And in that process, they, they are being tagged as fronts of the communist or the new people's army. Red tagging can also come in the form of pamphletas. These are these pamphlets either distributed in public malls or when we have uh, discussions such as this, a pack of leaflets would be left outside for everyone to pick up, featuring the names of the panelists, the organizers of the event as members, as fronts of the Communist Party of the Philippines, and thus our officers and members of the New People's Army publicly distributed without uh, designation as where it comes from. It could, it, here it characterizes this particular man who is a priest of the Iglesia Filipina Independiente who in their uh, service of the poor for, uh, for, the, for the faith go to the rural communities and because of that, he and his church Iglesia Filipina Independiente, tagged as communist terrorist. And so he is a demon, so to speak. Yeah, I did. Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> These are some, just some of the forms of red tagging. And this one, ah, sorry. Hi. There you go. Also, another set of leaflets featuring myself and my mother as high-ranking officials, as commanders, as battalions of a battalion of a new people's army. My mother is also a staunch human rights lawyer. She was a uh, labor arbiter from the National Labor Relations Commission, an agency of the government, and yet because of her labor advocacy, labor rights advocacy, still she is tagged even as a high-ranking member of the New People's Army. There is a dangerous implication here. As noticed by then Special Rapporteur on extrajudicial summary and arbitrary executions, Mr. Philip Alston, when he visited the Philippines in 2017, if I'm not mistaken, he observed that the result of this red tagging is that a wide range of groups, including human rights advocates, labor union organizers, journalists, teachers, teachers unions, women's groups, indigenous organizations, religious groups, students, agrarian reform advocates, and others, are classified as fronts and then as enemies of the state that are accordingly considered to be legitimate targets. So, in effect, the red tagging blurs the line, makes, the makes no credit to the distinction between a civilian activist and an armed combatant in violation of international humanitarian law. Very good. At worst, red tagging may lead to besmirched reputation. Your name is put on that black tarpaulin. Everyone can see it in the public. National High Road. Attorney Musni, Bishop Ablon, uh, Edre Olalia, Zarate, Terrorista, gives you a a bad bad name in public that you are a not a, that you are a terrorist so people will shy away from you or your organization or your campaigns or your advocacy surveillance we have noticed that once we are red tagged once our name is in that pamphlet once our name is in that tarpaulin a lot of surveillance happening on in our homes in the offices that we go to in our meetings in the protest actions and you, you would feel, you would see them with a sharp cut hair, acting suspiciously. You would see for increased surveillance, work, home, collective actions. Cyber attacks. A lot of our uh, colleagues have been attacked by trolls 
in the uh, social media platforms saying, ah, th this is why you rally because you're a terrorist. Why don't you just shut up? You are uh, an enemy of the state. Attack us in cyber media, cyber uh, uh, social media platforms. Worst case, judicial harassments. Judicial harassments come in the form of false and fabricated criminal charges of non-bailable offenses. We have seen that human rights defenders face these criminal charges with a lot of human rights violations, apart from which is a violation of the right to due process. We, our colleagues, have not been informed that there is a charge against us for ambush, for rebellion, for murder in Manila, in Baguio, in General Santos City, in wherever island, in, the, in one of those 7,100 islands that we have. We do not know because of the because of the failure also or the inefficiency of the judicial and the prosecution system, which is part of the state, judicial harassments. And we have seen that those who have been arrested either through a false search warrant or a fabricated charge throughout a warrant of arrest, when arrested, Further attacks, further cases will be filed against that person, making him rot in jail for non-bailable offenses, judicial harassment. Illegal arrests. A lot of cases where offices and homes of human rights defenders were raided in the middle of the night by elements of military and the police and the criminal in intelligence and detective agency in a joint effort using only a search warrant to search, quote-unquote, firearms and explosives in that office or in that home. And when they do in these raids, of course, what happens? Planting of evidence. Planting of evidence? Ah, there is uh, evidence here. We will then arrest you. Illegal possession of explosive is non-bailable. In the end, with just a use of a search warrant, which is not an arrest warrant, in the end, it leads to an arrest because of planting of evidence. So then the human rights offender are in jail. So further uh, cases against him, then he will be subjected to further interrogation, which may break his soul. And worse, summary executions, extrajudicial killings. We have a lot of cases, hundreds of cases, where one person, after he has been red tagged, after he, has, he or she has experienced increased surveillance, sooner or later, either you get yourself behind bars or six foot underground. And this is not an empty word. These are not empty words that we are speaking of here. Because our colleagues, Zara Alvarez has been shut down during the pandemic in August 20. 2020. When beat Zara Alvarez, she was in Europe that year advocating for the rights of sugarcane workers. Randy Chanes, a Chinese, a consultant, a peace consultant on the rights of farmers, assassinated in his in his home, three o'clock in the morning, shot dead August 10, 2020. The colleague of CAMS, uh, Dandy Miguel, a union leader, who shot dead during the pandemic. All these persons, before their uh, assassination, have been heavily red tagged. These are human rights defenders and peace consultants. Ay, hala. <laughs> So this is what we said, that red tagging is a form of a hit list. Hit meaning once you are red tagged, you are subjected to harassment, intimidation, and threat. Hit list. Sooner or later, the threat against your life, you would feel. Okay, thank you. And we have not yet, uh, and, and this EJK, summary killings, have also come to our, the ranks of lawyers as well. The lawyers who have stood up for the rights of human rights defenders, peasants, workers, 
Indigenous Peoples Women. Attorney Benjamin Ramos, work, uh, lawyer for sugarcane workers in Iloilo, as well as Anto Attorney Anthony Trinidad. During the Duterte administration from June 2016 to December, uh, July 2016 to June 2022, the National Union of People's Lawyers, my organization, has recorded 176 attacks against lawyers because of the primary exercise of our profession as lawyers. Of these 176 attacks, 59 are killings. In all of these 176 attacks, there has been red tagging. So that this red tagging is a multitude of violation of rights. It is a violation of a right to due process of law. It is a violation of a right to security, whether in the workplace or the security in, in, a, in, in, in general. Freedom of expression, it violates. Violates the freedom of assembly, as in the case of union, uh, trade union workers. And of course, it is a violation of a right to life. Not only mere right to life, but right to a dignified life and the right against arbitrary killing. This is the equation that we have been talking about. Red tagging is equal to CPP, NPA, NTF or the Communist Party of the Philippines, New People's Army, and its peace, uh, con peace platform, the National Democratic Fund, is equal to terrorists. And this branding is made on civilian activists. And this will be very short now. This is now where lawyers are needed, all the more. Because now in the Philippines, we have in place the anti-terror law. And this anti-terror law has been used, has been weaponized, we call it, against the people, against those who criticizes, dissents, or even defends our rights against an oppressive, tyrannical, uh, repressive regime. This anti-terror law has cemented the red tagging into law. Many provisions that we may be able to discuss in a separate incidents, but we have raised the unconstitutionality and the inv invalidity of these provisions of the law before the Supreme Court. And yet, sadly, the Supreme Court has uh, ruled that the said law has been or is valid and constitutional. We have raised the unconstitutionality of designation, whereby the Anti-Terror Council can just point at anyone, being it, anyone it found suspicious, to be terrorist, then it can designate. The anti-terror law has designated even recently a community doctor from the University of the Philippines. This is very recent. She is a community doctor working in the rural communities for years. She's an expert in that. And yet, because of her service to the poor, she is being designated, branded by the government as a terrorist. This is very grave. Arrest and detention on the mere suspicion, detention for at most 24 days without charge. This are all also an encroachment on judicial powers because as we say, no person can be arrested without a warrant that is issued by the court. But with the vast powers of the anti-terror council that is created by this anti-terror law, this power of the court to issue warrants and our right not to be arrested without a warrant has been uh, violated, has been undermined. So that we, join, we ask you to join us to repeal this anti-terror law because this is the epitome of red tagging in the law. This cements this dangerous practice of red tagging in the Philippine laws. But we can still have our voices heard by the Supreme Court, by the Congress to repeal, review, change, scrap this anti-terror law because it is against the exercise of the rights and freedoms that is enshrined by the Constitution and the international law. We call on everyone to join us to stop and no, to say no to red tagging and stop the attacks against human rights defenders.
Because as our chairperson, former chairperson of the National Union of People's Lawyers would say, Neri Colmenares, he would say, why we would, should continue the fight. He would say that because we fight for what is right and because we fight for what is just, and because we fight for and with the people, and for me, because we fight with love always, in the end, we shall win. So we continue the fight with you and with everyone. Dagang salamat, muchas gracias, and buenos dias a todos. Muchísimas, muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much for your witness, Sarina. Um, thank you to the three of you. I think it's been a first, a great first panel for this Mobile Social Congress to have a vision on the situation of workers, trade unionists, and defenders of human rights in the Philippines. Also, to get to know the state of the affairs and the different violations that are happening in these countries in the countries of origin of this manufacturing of electronic products. Thank you for your witness again. Thank you, for, thank you for your testimony. And thank you for your positive attitude, for your out, positive outlook after listening to such hard experiences and touching things because these are real stories of real people who are in the first line of defense and they are not being respected while they are respecting the human rights, carrying out advocacy in their origin countries and in the no global north. Thank you for this. We don't have any time for questions, but we are now moving on to the next panel. Thank you for your attention. Marta Rivera has summarized the issues we've heard and we have heard about the Philippines, the workers in the electronic sector and the violations of human rights in this sector. We have also discovered these different ways of red tagging about which Sarina was telling us. And this has to do with the second panel, actually, which is Freedom of Association guaranteed or prosecuted right. Freedom of association and forming of trade union is an issue that is still at the focus of the workers in different countries, especially in the Asian, the south of Asia. We will hear different testimonies, different witnesses in different countries, and we will hear how the technology, technology can be used to empower the workers as well. The moderation will be done by Manda Alonso, responsible of Comisiones Obreras, the trade, Spanish Trade Union, and the Foundation of Peace and Solidarity. For those of you who are following us online, remember to turn your mics off, please, so that we can make sure that we can hear our speakers. If you have any questions, you can write them in the chat, and let's hope that we will have enough time for questions this, for this, in, this second in this second panel. And regarding interpretation, you can choose the channel you want to follow this conference in. It can be English, Catalan, or Spanish. We are getting ready, and we are now giving space and giving way to the second panel. I wanted to also apologize for the fact that we are not being very sexist with the slides. We are a small NGO. The slide issue didn't go as we would have hoped, but we thank you for your patience. Doncs molt bona tarda a tothom. Good afternoon. We are starting the second panel now. Can we start? Yeah. We can start. We have a break planned. 
to go out and get some fresh air, go to, yes, go to the bathroom, whatever necessary, at 7 p.m. So I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I belong to uh, the Trade Union Comisiones Obreras. And as you can imagine, the next panel is about trade unions. Three men are here with us, and two of them are trade unionists, one linked with the trade union movement. We are going to talk about trade union freedoms and working rights. Our first presentation has to do with industry all a organization representing more than 50 million workers all around the world in 140 countries fighting for working and trade union rights for all these people in all along the supply chain his name is alexander Ivano, and he is a member of industrial he's been a member since 12 t12 coordinating the trade union work in the sector of material industries and also is responsible in the ICTs in the electric and electronic sectors. He is here to explain what industry all is doing in the technological and electronic industries and he's going to tell us about the repression of the trade unions in Malaysia by a company that is quite well known to all of you. Welcome and you have the floor. Okay, uh, good evening. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm really glad and honored. Um, I will then probably start from the, just a little bit explained about the Industrial Global Union, just to give you an idea of what, what is it. Close it, sorry. Yes, of course, I can, no worries. Okay, so Industrial Global Union uh, celebrated last year 10 years, but actually it's a much older organization. If you look at uh, at its uh, constituents, it has been created from three uh, trade union federations, International Metal Workers Federation, uh, International Federation of Chemical Energy Mine and General Workers Union, ICM, and uh, ITGLWF, the International Textile Government and Leather Workers Federation. And I can tell you already that the IMF has been created in 1893, <laughs> and it's uh, the, uh, the that's what we used to call the good IMF because there is also a different one. Um, that was the organization that create that was created to protect uh, workers' rights. But their first thing was focused on wages, by the way. So they were looking at the wages. Uh, of of their uh, co-workers in in uh, in the d nearby countries, and that's uh, enabled them to to let's say to put their claims for the for the wages. So the whole idea behind this merger that happened in 2012 in Copenhagen in Denmark was that we actually believe that another world is possible. And uh, to achieve it, we need uh, global union solidarity and cooperation for peace, democracy, and rights. And uh, that's essentially the global mission of the Industrial Global Union. It was designed like this, um, to secure social justice, uh, equality, and equity with a decent standard of living for all. So right now, the industrial uh, has the affiliated national trade unions in something like 140 countries, and we collectively represent approximately 50 million uh, workers, or rather to say our affiliates are representing 50 million. So we are kind of union of unions. It's not that we are best of the best, but just, I mean, <laughs> we are, uh, um, association of the unions. And this uh, essentially we represent approximately 14 sectors, and um, uh, one of them is uh, the ICT, uh, Information Communication Technologies, Electrical and uh, Electronics. And uh, what we are focusing on, I don't want to, let's say, to let's say to to speak too long, but I still wanted to give you some some ideas what we are actually focusing on. And uh, every four years, we have a Congress where we define, design our um, objectives and strategies and actions and how we are going to achieve these strategies. So uh, these are uh, at the last Congress were, uh, were designed as advancing workers' rights 
building union power, uh, confront global capital, and promote sustainable industrial policy. So as you understand, this is like really, really vague. I mean, in sense, white. Uh, and uh, in order to achieve these uh, uh, goals, uh, we we are working with our affiliates in different countries of the world. Uh, as I said, we have five regional offices uh, in uh, Montevideo, uh, which is in Uruguay, in Latin America. Uh, for Latin America in uh, Johannesburg, uh, South Africa for for the entire Sub-Saharan Africa. We have a special coordinator for the um, MENA region, um, which is Middle East and North Africa. Uh, we have an office in Moscow for the Eastern Europe, Central Asia and Caucasus. Uh, in Delhi, India, which is dealing with South Asia region and Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia uh, for Southeast Asia. So I actually, that's that's like a very introductory note about the industrial, but actually I would love to speak about two examples of the union busting where we were working together with, with our affiliates. Um, and uh, one of them is pretty old and one is fresh. And one of them, I that's something a little bit unprepared, uh, but it's kind of interesting that I chose Philippines that has been just uh, discussed now, but it's interesting that in uh, back in 2014, there was a uh, quite a, a severe case of union busting at NXP uh, Philippines. NXP is, uh, is uh, a very big producer of the Dutch producer, actually, of Dutch origin of the uh, semiconductors and uh, uh, different other um, um, equipment for the electronics. And what happened actually that at that time, uh, uh, the, the, the management of the company fired uh, uh, 20, uh, 24 trade union leaders who were in the middle of the, and they were in the middle of the collective bargaining. So it's absolutely crazy if you speak to about any person, uh, but here, uh, actually, what when we reacted for the first time, when we uh, we addressed to the NXP um, a message, and there was uh, actually essentially no replies, and we decided together with our affiliates to affiliate to increase the pressure, and uh, it was quite a long. Uh, let's say, long journey, so to say, but uh, eventually, which lasted five months. But uh, it actually allowed for us to build a very good alliance with good electronics. At that time, it actually allowed us to involve many different NGOs, uh, students, NGOs. I remember that some of us sent a letter that collected like over 100, 180,000 uh, signatures in in, in favor of these workers to be re reinstated. And uh, actually, uh, later we even had to confront Apple itself because what turned out uh, later that the NXP was producing uh, the uh, small chips for iPhone 6 at that time. And uh, once we targeted Apple, <laughs> Then suddenly things moved a bit, I must say. Yeah. And uh, eventually what happened is that uh, 12 dismissed people have been reinstated um, to their original work. And 12 other, unfortunately, over this time, um, not unfortunately, I mean, probably uh, good for them. They found another job, essentially, and they got some compensation. And in, interestingly, that the collective bargaining was happening uh, during this collective bargaining, the one of the demands was actually increase of wages, and the company was saying, "No, no, no, it's impossible. We're in a bad situation, so we're in a, such a bad shape. We cannot give you any hike." So after this uh, campaign, and I uh, and under a bit of pressure from the from the um, from all of us, and including Apple, by the way, in a way. Uh, the wage hike were like 12.5%. So that was a major serious increase uh, over three years, um, much higher than the company actually previously 
uh, even uh, dare to discuss. So that's uh, one case uh, where we, we have been very much involved and this was old and that was a kind of a strong victory. Um, on the other side, unfortunately, uh, not everything, not always goes well. So I want to give you another example, but here the case is not over yet. And uh, my colleague actually from uh, Malaysia had to speak about it. We're talking about the company called Molex in Malaysia. And this is uh, uh, our affiliate electronics industry employees union, Northern region. Uh, they uh, try to organize workers of this company. But uh, it was already uh, decided that 22nd of February last year, there will be a vote. Uh, for the presence of the union, uh, for the representation of the union. And suddenly on 7 of February, management of the of Molex Malaysia actually warned workers not to vote for the union. In fact, it was done in a very nasty way. The company HR uh, just uh, gathered uh, workers and used pretty abusive language and shouted at workers saying that if you join the union, then you will not get any bonuses you will you will not have any progress uh, where you are and all this type of uh, threats and actually someone has recorded this <laughs> and, but uh and uh, the union decided actually to lodge the complaint with the industrial relations department and that's uh, the institution that is actually looking at the unfair treatment of workers and it's kind of first instance institution and this uh, institution uh, suspended the, um, uh, the this secret ballot that was scheduled for 22nd of February and uh, uh, based on this lodge campaign of the of the union and immediately uh, uh, i mean soon after that they informed the union that they're going to uh, to carry out interviews with workers in the plant as part of their investigation so it was not enough for them um Unfortunately, what happened is that uh, uh, the it, it turned out that these interviews that they, they they would actually expose workers because uh, it would be done in the uh, at their workplaces and in front of their employers. So it was clear that uh, this type of results wouldn't be in favor of workers themselves, and it was easy for the employer to identify the the interviewed workers. So. Uh, of course, that was confronted by our affiliate, and they essentially said we disagree with this way. And uh, the case was, uh, uh, let's say, uh, pending. We tried to, of course, we from our side as industrial, we addressed the, the company straight away, uh, even in the, in, the, in the first instance when we knew about the problem. And uh, yet, uh, let's say, uh, it didn't move on. We also now working with uh, other uh, colleagues, uh, Dutch colleagues, for instance, we address to them. Also with Good Electronics, we're trying to address the headquarters in the Netherlands and uh, in order to solve this uh, situation. So there are still a big arsenal of measures that can be applied in order to solve this uh, problem. But let's say this is, I just wanted to tell you that this, the case that uh, didn't work out well so far, at least. Yeah. Uh, and I think I, okay. No, no, no. I'm just asking whether I already used my time. <laughs> Entenc, doncs, que tenim temps per fer alguna pregunta. No sé si aquí la gent de la sala vol... Maybe just for time for questions, if anybody has a question for Alexander. Sure, go ahead. My question is, how is industrial 
working together with the Spanish trade unions, with trade unions that are part of industrial. How are they working when it comes to public procurement and, and also. for the work for this so research first, regarding the supply chain? I, the first question would be, which are the trade, Spanish trade unions that are part of your association? And secondly, how are you working with them? It's possible to know. I think it's at least at least who had the Commission of Sobreros most. But actually, uh, whether we are working with them on public procurement, that's a I, I, don't, I can I can actually speak to you a little bit about the public procurement project that we have together with your colleague sitting next to you, Laura, um, about uh, the the project um, in uh, Malaysia uh, that is being now. Uh, implemented together with electronics watch and the idea is basically I'll, really briefly and I'll, I'll let you speak then. <laughs> really briefly so uh, we have a project now uh, where we are trying to use the the leverage of the public procurement organizations those who are buying in bulk the electronic equipment and at these factories where this equipment is being produced when there is an organizing drive and if there are some problems, we essentially try to solve them, including through the leverage and pressure of uh, these organizations, which are or these institutions which are buying this uh, uh, the, the, these products. Essentially, and that's it. Public procurement. Anything else? Yeah, he has answered the question. That's what I was asking. Thank you. Any other questions then? Hello. Hi. Uh, thank you that you are uh, working on the Philippines on the case of union busting. I wanted to ask if you still continue to work in the Philippines and do you also have partners with the trade unions in the Philippines that we have, such as in the CTUHR and many other workers' organizations in the Philippines that they might be able to work together for the workers' defense of workers' rights? Thank you very much. Yes, uh, of course, we have. We have actually, I'm just looking even now on our, on our website, we have many affiliates in, in Philippines. Me particularly, I'm working actually with uh, MWAP uh, and uh, MAP, which is uh, Metal, Workers, uh, Metal Workers Association of Philippines and uh, also uh, the, the code uh, PMA, sorry, uh, Philippines Metal Workers Alliance. Yeah, that's... that's uh, uh, that's particularly for my sector, but we have also other sectors, of course, and and uh, usually we are working through our regional offices there. In this in these cases, Southeast Asia office uh, based in Kuala Lumpur, and uh, of course we are doing <laughs> a lot of stuff with them, <laughs> including I think the recent there was a participation in this uh, ILO mission that was organized high mission to to the Philippines, which essentially confirmed all what was said about the violations of human and trade union rights. Um, of course, we will continue doing this in the future. That's that's for sure. You can you 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 can be absolutely assured. Thank you very much, Alexander. Well, that was our first panelist, and we are going to move on to our second one. And it's quite a difficult name for me to pronounce. Walap Shojit, working on NXP Workers Union Thailand, and the Bangkok seat for the last 20 years, member of the trade union intercompany, and has been elected president of the trade union. He's coming to talk about their negotiations with this company in Thailand, where he's been working. We have provoked the firing of 13 trade union leaders who had allegedly falsified 
documentation. This is the case in this company in Bangkok. Wallab will tell us about it. Welcome, Wallab. Can you hear us? Uh, uh, my name is Malop Chujit from Thailand Industry Workers Manufacturing Union. ครับเอ่อก็จะมานําเสนอเกี่ยวกับการปกป้องสิทธิแรงงานของเรานะครับ I think you speak so well ครับก็มีมีแล็กพัชชินียูเฮียร์มีฮัลโหล sorry can you start again you hear me? I am Lek Pachini. I'm Pachini. I'm, I am Wallop's interpreter. You hear me? Wallop บอกปะคะ? เขาเป็นเป็นภาษาอังกฤษด้วยว่า I have interpreter. Please tell her to turn on her camera, please. Hello. Hello. You can start. Let Let begin now. ได้ได้ยินเสียงวันลบแต่ว่าคนอื่นเขาได้ยินเล็กหรือเปล่าโอ้โหยูเฮียร์มีเอ่อยูเฮียร์เล็กพัชชนี you hear me uh you hear lake she is my interpreter she is she is my interpreter hello Yes, we can hear you, uh, Lek and Wallop. We can hear you. You can proceed. Okay, let's start, Wallop. Have you got a chair slide, please? Chair slide, please. Walk slide, please. I have PowerPoint. Oh, slide, please. Uh, my PowerPoint. Please chair slide. Okay, give me one second. Please chat, please chat, slides, uh, our voice. What do you know? You hear one look? My lip made in Hong Kong, Leah. No. Who play, who play? I'm not Okay, thank you, Captain Clap. โอเคคุณเลยค่ะต่อเลยค่ะครับคุณเลยครับผมก็สไลด์ชูสไลด์ชูสภาพแรงงานเอ็นเอสพีนะครับอยู่ที่กรุงเทพนะครับประเทศไ
เอ่อส่วนใหญ่ก็จะเป็นพนักง,งานหญิงแล้วก็เป็นพนักง,งานรายวันครับ and uh, okay. most of the employees is uh, are women ครับแล้วก็ก่อนที่จะเอ่อรายงานปัญหาเกี่ยวกับสิทธิการปกป้องสิทธิรายงานปัจจุบันก็จะขอรายงานปัญหาที่เกิดขึ้นในอดีตในรอบสิบปีด้วยด้วยครับที่ส่งผลมาถึงปัจจุบันนี้นะฮะ So uh, w e l o p would like to share you about uh, labor disputes during during uh, 10 years. ต่อเลยค่ะช่างช่างสไลด์มันอ๋อโอเคครับก็ใช้สไลด์เราเป็นหลักอันนี้ก็เป็นเหตุการณ์นะครับแล้วเคยมีเหตุการณ์ปิดงานนัดหยุดงานนะครับก็เป็นจำนวนสิบห้าสิบเก้าวันเมื่อเมื่อปีสองพันสิบสามนะครับจากข้อพิพาทรายงานที่ในจ้างต้องการเปลี่ยนเป็นระบบสี่วันหยุดสองวันนะครับอ่า so the main uh this labor dispute is about that uh the company would like to change the working hour system from uh six day uh on and one day off uh into four day On and two days off. ต่อเลยค่ะครับในการชุมนุมนัดหยุดงานนั้นก็มีพี่ๆผู้นำรายงานให้กำลังใจช่วยเหลือกันนะครับโอ้เดี๋ยวหาสไลด์ก่อนต่อเลยค่ะต่อเลยค่ะมันสั้นเกินไปต่อเลยครับแล้วก็ยาวเลยมันขอแป๊บหนึ่งขอดูสไลด์จากตรงนี้ก่อนของตัวเองนะดูของตัวเองได้ได้ได้เดี๋ยวท่านขอขอโทษทีนะของตัวเองเป็นหลักค่ะไม่ต้องไปดูจอโอเคโอเคไม่ต้องไปสนจอแล้วเดี๋ยวนี้เพราะว่าเล็กคุมอยู่ได้ได้ได้จะได้ไวๆค่ะเพราะว่ามันเสียเวลาเยอะละครับครับก็คือว่าระบบสี่วันก็เราก็จะมีการขับเคลื่อนนะครับไปยังกระทรวงแรงงานสํานักงานส่งเสริมการลงทุนคณะกรรมการสิทธิมนุษยชนแล้วก็กระทรวงอุตสาหกรรมแล้วก็สถานทูตนะครับในการเคลื่อนไหวในครั้งนั้นนะครับอ่า you can see that the the first uh Big dispute of the NSP is uh, on 2013, you know, 10 years ago, and the problem is the working system. And so the NSP union uh, called for uh, strike for 59 day, 59 day, and then they have like a demonstration in different places, like Ministry of Labor, uh, Board of Investment, uh, and National Commissions on Human Rights uh, of Thailand. Ministry of Industry and Embassies of the Netherlands with the others, uh, with Af uh, with unions, other unions. ต่อเลยค่ะครับก็สาเหตุที่ต้องนัดจุดงานก็เกิดจากว่าระบบนี้ทําให้ค่าจ้างลดลงนะครับเพราะว่าเป็นลูกจ้างรายวันจะมีค่าจ้างเดี๋ยอยู่แค่ยี่สิบวันต่อเดือนนะครับแล้วก็ทําให้เกิดปัญหาสุขภาพมีการเปลี่ยนกะเร็วต้องทํางานวันละสิบสองชั่วโมงแล้วก็ไม่มีเวลาให้ครอบครัวแล้วก็สังคมครับวันหยุดก็จะหมุนเวียนไปเรื่อยๆครับค่ะอ่า and you know that the the new system you know the new shift a uh, schedule a uh, four day work and two day off system a uh, affect a uh, to workers a lot uh, for example income decreases because the working day reduce from to a uh, 20 days a month and most of them you know work Uh, most of the workers are daily wage, so that they so because the, and then they get only minimum wage. And number two is like uh, they have uh, a lot of uh, problem uh, like uh, because of fast shift change and twelve hours shift uh, affects their health and family life. Sorry, ha. เอ่อการปิดงานนัดหยุดงานได้ก็ได้จบลงด้วยการที่ต้องยอมเปลี่ยนแปลงตามนายจ้างครับ so the ah uh, then the lock ah uh, after long strike the lockout strike has ended and unions are like ah uh, firstly ah uh, are forced to agree to uh, agree the the new system ครับหลังจากปีหลังจากที่เหตุการณ์นัดหยุดงานผ่านไปแล้วเนี่ยก็ทําให้สาภาพมีความเข้มแข็งลดน้อยลงนะครับจากปัญหาเศรษฐกิจแล้วก็วันเวลาทํางานที่เปลี่ยนแปลงไปวันหยุดไม่ตรงกันครับทําให้มีสภาพที่ไม่เอื้อรวมตัวของคนงานครับสาภาพจึงอยู่ในภาวะฟื้นฟูมาอย่างต่อเนื่องครับ so 
uh, after the work, the, com the company changed the system to four day work and two days off. Uh, the, the workers uh, uh, feel like uh, they are like uh, weekend. So now they are in the in the state in this circumstance of rehabilitation. So because of they feel like they are uh, weak weaker. So they need they are like trying to rehabilitate themselves. ในปัจจุบันครับเหตุเหตุปัญหาที่ทําให้เกิดการเลิกจ้างในปัจจุบันนี้นะครับก็เริ่มต้นมาจากปี 2020 ไม่ปฏิบัติตามข้อตกลงนะครับเมื่อฟ้องศาลแล้วเนี่ยก็เอ่อเมื่อฟ้องศาลแล้วก็ศาลก็ได้ไก่เกี่ยวก็ตกล
dismiss the union leaders, 10 union leaders and former uh, and three former uh, leaders, three former union leaders. So uh, after that, the labor, the workers, eh, the union leaders uh, have tried to, uh, to have a dialogue with the, the company. But anyway, they, uh, they cannot like uh, meet the agree agreement. The, the company uh, refused to reinstate the, the union leaders as demanded. So they have to like uh, uh, the they have to like uh, the company had like uh, they have to fight in the labor court. Yeah. ครับอันนี้ก็เป็นภาพตอนที่ถูกเลิกจ้างออกจากโรงงานนะครับก็ได้เอาเอกสารออกมานะครับก็ในสิบสามคนนี้ก็คือกรรมการที่ไปดําเนินการฟ้องอในคดีทั้งหมดนะครับแต่ว่าถูกแบ่งออกเป็นสามคนเนี่ยเป็นอดีตกรรมการที่ไม่ได้เป็นกรรมการลูกจ้างบริษัทสามารถเลิกจ้างได้ทันทีส่วนอีกสิบคนเนี่ยเป็นกรรมการลูกจ้างเนี่ยจะต้องขออนุญาตศาลก่อนจริงจะเลิกจ้างได้ครับอ่า uh, you know that uh be the the company you know anyway because the dismissed work uh labor leaders you know are protected by the labor relation uh laws so the company need to seek a uh, permission from the labor court to terminate employment of a uh, labor uh, leaders and the, and the former labor leader so yeah so they have to back and uh each uh, to back and uh and mediate in the process of mediation in the labor court so now on this uh, on, the, on the you can see you know struggles outside the factory that the unions are tied to organize the meetings in uh outside the factory because they are not this this means uh labor leaders you know they are not permitted to to enter the company so have they have to move out and have to use the temporary uh office to find uh, a, temp a new office please make page next slide อันนี้ก็ทางสมาพันธ์เครื่องใช้ไฟฟ้ายานยนต์และโลหะแห่งประเทศไทยนะครับหรือทีมก็เข้ามาให้การช่วยเหลือนะครับโดยมาประชุมที่ที่ทำงานชั่วคราวนะครับมันยี่สิบนาทีต่อเลยค่ะโอเคครับช่วยแล้วโอเคจากนั้นก็สารก็นัดสืบพยานเอสารนัดไกลเกี่ยกับคณะกรรมการลูกจ้างนะครับในวันที่ในเดือนเมษายน2022นะครับผลการแก้เกี่ยเนี่ยคณะกรรมการ10คนนี้ไม่สามารถตกลงกันได้นะครับแล้วก็ต่อมาสารก็เอเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวแป๊บนึงค่ะ so you know that uh, during the court court hearing the they got support from the uh, confederation because the NSP union is affiliated with the Uh, Confederation of Thai Appliances and Electronics, Automobile and Metal Workers, workers. and you know you can see the number 13, slide number 13, that uh, the Central Labor Court arranged the mediation of the case on the dismissal of union committees. They, so the Central uh, the Labor Court uh, arranged with the 10, 10 uh, dismissed uh, labor leaders. But anyway, the at last the uh, the the result of the mediations in the court, you know, two parties cannot come to an agreement because the company insisted to not sorry not to reinstate them. I'm sorry, I translate translated long on the slides, and the union committees are still demand to return to work. 
ตาเลยค่ะครับแล้วต่อมาสารก็นัดกำหนดประเด็นพิจารณาแล้วก็ทั้งสิบคนนี้ก็มานัดสิบพยานในเดือนมิถุนาสองพันยี่สิบสามเลยครับ And then you know that after mediation process, uh, the next process is a hearing, a court hearing of all the testimony. So, uh, the the court already arranged the uh court hearing already in. เมื่อไหร่เนี่ยอันนี้นัดอะไรคะเนี่ยก็นัดสืบนัดสืบพยานสืบพยานปีนี้ไม่ใช่หรอ This year, this year, court hearing will be happy. This year, make it 2022. Oh, 22. That's the process of the year. Okay. This is the case of the case of the case. The case of 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 the case. Uh, labor leaders, you know, they uh, filed a petition for the unfair dismissal to the Labor Relations Committee. It is the mechanism of the lab, of the Ministry of Labor. And, and, and at, like call, uh, last uh, and last, she won. She won because the Labor Relations Committee issued the issued the verdict already to reinstate her and force the company to pay to reinstate her and. Pay back uh all the damage. Next slide, please. Sixteen. Sorry, ค่ะเด็กพูดไปแล้ววัชนะก็ sixteen. มีคําสั่งมีคําสั่งให้กับคอรสก็มีคําสั่งให้กลับเข้าทํางานนะครับแต่ว่าบริษัทไม่รับกลับแต่ว่าไปใช้เอ่อใช้สิทธิ์ในการฟ้องเพิกถอนคําสั่งคอรสต่อนะครับแล้วก็เอ่อก็จะมีสารนัดสืบพยานในวันที่ยี่สิบกันยายนปีนี้นะครับยี่สิบยี่สิบเอ็ดยิบสองกันยายนปีนี้นะครับปีนี้นี่ปีสองพันยี่สิบอ่าโอเคโอเคอ่า and anyway the company deny to follow the order of the labor relations committee to reinstate uh her the former labor leaders so because the company can like uh, appeal To the labor court to nullify the L the LRC orders because you know that the LRC's uh verdicts you know that said that uh union former union leaders did not do any did not uh commit any offense offenses as accused by the company and there is no intention whatsoever. Uh, to mislead uh, or damage the company. Okay, uh, next slide, please. ครับแล้วก็ในระหว่างนี้สาภาพแรงงานก็มีการยื่นข้อเรียกร้องด้วยนะครับเมื่อเดือนสิงหาคมของอ๋อันนี้ก่อนเนาะอันนี้ยี่สิบหกยี่สิบหกอันนี้ก็มีการเจรจาในระบบแรงงานสัมพันธ์นะครับกระทรวงโอเคที่กระทรวงแรงงานนะครับแล้วก็บริษัทเนี่ยก็ยืนยันที่จะยังไม่รับกลับค่าทํางานแต่ว่าให้รอผลของสาOkay, you know that the NSP worker union try to keep to uh to keep the lab good labor relation with the company, so they uh ask the uh so they use the mechanism of Ministry of Labor by using the by meeting with the Director General of uh. Labor protection and welfare to help them. ครับแล้วก็ตอบเอ่อสไลด์ต่อไปก็คือว่าในระหว่างนี้เราก็มีการยื่นข้อเรียกร้องด้วยนะครับโดยที่เราเนี่ยถูกอยู่เอ่อกรรมการสิบคนในถูกอยู่ข้างนอกนะครับจะต้องมายื่นข้อเรียกร้องที่บริเวณด้านนอกบริษัทนะครับแล้วก็มีการเจรจาอยู่เจ็ดครั้งเอ่อผลการเจรจานี้ไม่คืบหน้านะครับบริษัทต้องการให้ถอนข้อเรียกร้องนะครับตอนนี้ก็ยังอยู่ในช่วงการเจรจาอยู่นะครับค่ะ now anyway the union uh, have still have the right to submit a demand to the company so last year they have like uh, submitted demand uh, and then 
they have uh, collected bargaining over demands for seven times already. มันลบเขาบอกว่าเวลาจะหมดแล้วช่วยสรุปเลยค่ะอ่าครับสรุปก็คือแล้วก็เหลืออีกอีกครั้งหนึ่ง Sorry Sorry ว่าเราเอ่อ you have only a minute มีเวลาหนึ่งนาทีโอเคโอเคโอเคก็ผลกระทบนะครับก็ถือว่าตอนนี้ก็เดี๋ยวบริษัทเดี๋ยวจะมาให้คําตอบอีกทีหนึ่งว่าในวันที่เจ็ดมีนาคมว่าจะเอ่อให้เอ่อว่าจะรับกลับหรือไม่รับกลับเข้าทํางานนะครับแล้วก็ในส่วนผลกระทบของสาภาพแรงงานเนี่ยก็ทําให้เราครับอันนี้ก็เป็นการขับเคลื่อนของเดี๋ยวเล็กสรุปให้เลยโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเคโอเ Uh, companies answer again in March soon. So, and and he would like to share you about the impact of the labor uh, union and the labor uh, union committee as well that they have quite uh, been suffering from the uh, dismissal because they are their their income reduces because they are living with the minimum wage only a thousand. Bus. Yeah, and anyway, we are are trying to plan to uh plan to fight back. Thank you. Dos muchísimas gracias um por el testimonio. Thank you very much for your witness and your testimony. As you can see, we have quite a hard situation around the world. Unfortunately, we don't have time for questions now, but I will give the floor to our third panelist, Lauren Goldberg, an activist for social justice and a former trade union organizer. He has created initiatives for the benefit of workers in the United States, in New Zealand, in Australia. He's presenting Work It. And he was going to present the, some cases of success for this app. Welcome, Oren. He's frozen. Welcome, Oren. Thank you so He's much. Frozen. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm very honored and uh, pleased to be in such amazing company. Um, when I hear these stories, the uh, they sound like our stories. These stories are the same all over the world, and I'm so glad that we can be here together to talk about it. And I hope that we can all work together for something better, uh, which is. What we're all trying to do, I think. Um, so uh, again, my name is Oren Goldberg, Director of Engineering at United for Respect. Um, United for Respect is a nonprofit that uh, works with uh, worker underpaid retail workers across the United States, um, and within United for Respect. And I'm about to tell a, a deeper story. But we have a department that builds technology tools, not just for United for Respect, but for other organizations around the world who are aligned with our our goals and our vision. So before I even get started, I want to let everybody know that if your organization is looking for tools to help you do better organizing, we'd like to help you and work with you together. Um, So please reach out uh, if you are interested in that. Um, so uh, let me get started here. Uh, so um, and you can see my slides, correct? Great. Uh, so first, a little history about the organization um, uh, and and sort of the context of its creation. In 2008. Uh, In the United States and I think around the world, we experienced a very large recession. Um, and involuntary part-time jobs 
skyrocketed. People who wanted to work full time but could only find part time work um, in the US, uh, it increased by 5 million. Um, and moving from part time to full time became something that was considered a promotion. Um, and it has really eroded people's ability to advance up the career ladder. 61% um, of full-time workers surveyed had previously worked part-time positions at their current employer. 80% um, of those workers who experienced any upward mobility have worked part-time in the past. Um, and in 2010, United for Respect, at the time we were called our Walmart. Um, Walmart is the biggest retailer in the United States. Um, they have locations all over the world. In the United States, they represent 1% of all employees. That 1% of all US employees work at Walmart. Um, so uh, we were trying to focus on how do we organize these workers in retail? Um, the, a retail salesperson is the most common job in the United States, accounting for one in every 10 jobs. And um, there's a lot of low compensation, um, which causes people's an, an inability to make ends meet, to pay for food, shelter, and all, all these things that we all know that we need every day. Um, a, and we, we knew that. Um, and what we learned more as we started talking to people and really trying to understand the situation is that there's a lot more than just that. Uh, and there's uh, increased feelings of isolation that people feel, being disrespected at work, inconsistent schedules, and that makes it impossible to hold a second job, even though you're underpaid because the second job schedule and the first job schedule can never work together. Um, it makes it impossible to go back to school. It makes it impossible to care for your families. Um, and, and as hours get reduced, you increase your debt uh, and it becomes very challenging. So as we kept learning about these stories, we, we and did research about what was going on, we shared this information back out and as all of the organizers who are, are watching have seen themselves, uh, people start with shame about their situation. And when they learn that this is a bigger picture, that it's not just you, it turns into collective outrage. And that's how we can organize people because by realizing that. In 2013, more than 80,000 people across the country walked out of their jobs at Walmart. They wanted to communicate their outrage at helping to build what was then a $17 billion company and having themselves living off of living off poverty wages and being disrespected for their work at the same time. Since then, Walmart has changed a number of policies and practices around scheduling. They've made the process more transparent. The schedule is more predictable and they've offered more hours. Um, in 2015, San Francisco became the first city to pass a fair work week law. It's regulated work hours, uh, required advance notice for work schedules and gave predictable pay. The state of Oregon followed suit in 2017. Now 1.8 million people working in low wage jobs are protected under a fair work week law. Whoops, sorry. Okay, so what is our approach? How have we, how did all this happen? Um, our model is based on bridging the gap between people's experiences at work and the structures that govern our work. So we start with connecting to people, connecting people to resources and connecting people to each other via our communities of support, which is technology that we leverage and sometimes build in order to help give people an online space to communicate with one another safely. Uh, we analyze 
Um, we collect a tremendous amount of data through surveys, social media conversations, and we do our own in-depth industry research. Then we partner and collaborate and support with others in the field who are doing complementary and mission-aligned work, community-based organizations and worker centers, policy institutions, and media partners. Um, and then we advocate, uh, we take action. We, uh, we campaign around specific areas like scheduling, wages, um, scheduling, those things we focus. Uh, we file shareholder resolutions and we create state-based coalitions to pass legislation. This is all to drive towards structural change. Uh, so what we realized is we need to scale what we're doing because you can't just focus on these things and, and ex expect to be able to solve the problems if you're only looking at one set of workers. It's because the whole, we have a bigger problem than one employer. Um, and so we leverage technology to figure out how can we talk to more people more easily? Um, and the work that we've done has led to $3 billion in higher wages for em employees across the country, um, a paid family leave policy at Walmart, um, ending on-call scheduling for 13 different major retailers, and uh, Toys R Us, if you're not familiar, is a huge toy store chain in the United States that went bankrupt. They went out of business because private equity really sort of bought them up and manipulated the situation to leverage as much money as they can without caring about any of the workers. So we got the workers to organize it and, and we got Toys R Us to give a $20 million fund for those families. Um, so how do we leverage technology? Um, so that, that this is where, to me, things are, are interesting because it's not a typical um, union model, although it's complementary to what unions do. So unions can leverage our technology, as can nonprofit worker centers and other organizations. Um, one of the things we learned early on is that we need a space to get support for workplace challenges and to get information about work, whether that's policy or law. We know that people can't find that at work. They need trust and they don't have it. Um, they fear retaliation if they ask about the wrong question. Um, and there's no transparency or access to company policy. Using Walmart as an example again, there, there is an employee handbook, but you're not allowed to see it. If you wanna see it, you have to ask your manager to look at the computer in their office while they're watching you. Um, so they're, the only way you can figure out what's going on is like under their supervision. So we created actually an application that helps these workers access the information they need without having to go ask their boss. Um, 82% of people have smartphones and 50% of these workers, they only access the internet through their smartphones. So we focus on a mobile first strategy. Um, and we knew that people were using uh, social media like Facebook and other tools to, to connect and communicate with each other. But those aren't really the right platforms to provide accurate information about company policies and rights at work. If things get buried under, you know, thousands of comments. Uh, there's no privacy. People give opinions, incorrect answers. That it's not reliable information. So uh, we built a tool called Work It that allows people to ask any question about work and get an answer. Um, we use machine learning on uh, to try to understand the intent of, of somebody's question 
and we provide an answer that's applicable um, to the person asking, whether it's around employer regulations, geographic laws around that region or employment status information. Um, and uh, we also built tools on the back end that allows uh, the trained advisors to find resources that they need to answer these questions. Um, we're collecting the really the largest data set in the US on people's experiences in low wage jobs. Um, so 77,000 people have downloaded our app. Um, we have a lot of statistics here you can see on the slide. So I won't I won't read through it all, but um, we've managed to get a lot of different organizations um, to leverage this technology to help their the workers that are their members and that they're trying to reach out to. Um, and our total reach is now 4 million people. Um, I couldn't be more proud to be a part of, of this work. Um, I think it's it's been incre an incredible journey. Um, and we have, we're now sort of working very hard to expand our tool set um, to provide as many useful tools as we can for workers and, and really now for organizers. We're trying to think a lot harder about what do organizers need to do their job better so that they can benefit workers better. Um, so we've built tools like you can see on this slide that uh, allow the ability to, to track data, to, to surface patterns. Um, so you can think about things like, well, actually the inspiration, what started this was uh, when COVID hit, we started needing to know a lot more about how COVID is impacting workers. Um, where are people getting positive tests? Where are people not getting the masks and that they need and the other care that they need? Um, and so we started, we built this tool to kind of accept crowdsource data from workers so they could report like that there's not enough people to cover their shift or somebody's sick, but they're not allowed to take off from work um, and be able to sort of chart this stuff and then this has several functions. One is that it allows an, an organizing team to strategize around where problems are really happening. And additionally, um, there's an option to make the data public. So you can show the world what is going on and and really like inform the public and the workers themselves about what 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 their situation looks like on a larger scale. Um, um, sorry, Oren, uh, you have only two minutes. Great, thank, thank you. you. Um, okay, so uh, our tools are, they work on all mobile platforms um, and on the web um, to make it really accessible and easy to use. Um, we also have tools that allow people, allow organizers to kind of like scrape data from different sources and aggregate it and collect it um, to help them get information that they need on in a way that's automated um, and the ability to make things multilingual uh, which we found is uh, increasingly and just very important people need to understand uh, but and by the way since i'm talking about that uh, i just want to thank the team here organizing this conference for really enabling translation and interpretation for everybody so well. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the need for work it is growing with the growth of the gig economy, increase in part-time jobs. Uh, the low wage sector is the fastest growing sector of workers. There's increase in surveillance capitalism. So we need to have our own tools instead of leveraging the tools made by these big corporations. Um, and being able to leverage, here we say thick data, that really means qualitative data, 
it's not just about numbers. It's about collecting real experiences and understanding them. That is uh, super important for the work that we're doing. Um, so um, in summary, whoops, sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm losing control of my slides here. I apologize. Uh, this is the one that I want to show. Looking ahead, uh, we want to utilize what we're doing to build power. And again, I, I just want to emphasize, like, we're really looking to help other organizations. In fact, our tech department is in the process of splitting out so we can really focus on building tools for the movement across the board to help organizations that are underfunded and and unable to build their own tools uh, so that we can uh, help them level up to meet the modern world and to have the same technological tools that these corporations have so that uh, it's not just a bringing a sword to a gunfight. Um, so uh, I guess I'll leave it there. I know I'm at my time limit. I appreciate everyone. and. Uh, I look forward to learning more and hearing everybody's stories. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Well, we are getting to the end of the panel because we're running out of time. I would like to thank Alexander, Olop, and Oren again for their brave testimonies telling us about alarming cases which are violating trade union and working rights. The case of XNP manufacturing was scandalous. We have gotten to hear what's being done by the international trade unionism, and we have gotten to know an app to complement the work of trade unions. Thank you, all of you, for your attention. Thank you for your reflections. Let's have a 15-minute break so that you can go outside. We have a little snack outside. You can have a drink, have a snack, and we will see you in 15 minutes. 25 past 7, we'll see you here. Welcome again after this short break and let's start the last panel of the mobile social context with turning around mining and we will have two panelists that uh, have to be here because George Bukundu who had to talk about the Democrat Democratic Republic of Congo cannot attend. We are going to talk about mining in Bolivia, listening to the experience of uh, civil society organizations that work to improve labor conditions of uh, miners, and we will listen to the recommendations adopted by the European Union concerning mining exploitation. For those following us online, we would remind you that to choose the language of interpretation, you have to look, choose the language and that you can tweet um, everything you want concerning what the speakers say. We have two hashtags, hashtag MC23 and uh, hashtag Al Nostro Mobil. The last session will be chaired by Alberto Guerrero, who is an advocacy uh, officer of Alternative Exchanges uh, devoted to indigenous populations. So I'll give you the floor, Alberto. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you for being here. Now that we had a break, we can carry on for two or three more hours. I'm going to switch into Spanish because Diego and Jesus speak in Spanish, so they don't have to rely on interpretation. So that's all we wanted to say as a way of an introduction. And we're going to start this roundtable. We won't be able to listen to George, who is going to speak about the situation in Africa, which is probably uh, unknown and more unknown than other subjects that are going to be dealt with at this roundtable. But we will have a balance because we will listen to experiences in Latin America and also we will get to know different positions from the European Union. 
and local organizations. And maybe, maybe, since we only have a couple of speakers, unless they talk for too long, we will have some time for q and I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Jesus Alberto Real Campos, who is online, a specialist in economy, 20 years of uh, experience in institutions of social and economic development. He has developed proposals and projects in public policies management, development planning, highlighting the importance of local economic strategies and productive uh, processes for uh, local mining in Honduras, La Paz, and Patosí, Bolivia. He's in charge of the Center of Research and Popular Service, except from where he is the leader of different teams which propose uh, ideas to make a more efficient local management and to improve the working conditions of the miners in Bolivia. Uh, Jesus Alberto, I think you can hear me, so please go ahead and thank you very much for being here with us. Okay, so thank you very much, Alberto and Diego, and uh, I would like to express my gratitude for allowing me to share with you this moment and to be able to speak about the conditions of mining in Bolivia and how is this related to electronics and the global market. I'm going to, if you allow me, share my presentation. I don't know who is moderating. I'm not able to share my screen right now. I think that someone else is going to do it. Okay, while you share my screen, I would like to tell you, first of all, that what I'm going to present here, it's a case study of a mine, a cooperative. In Bolivia, there are three types of uh, mining operators, those who extract the mineral. The state one, the Bolivian state, with mines operating under its uh, ownership, and then private mining, where we have uh, small size and medium size mining companies, which also extract, and what we call the cooperative uh, mining system, which is a system by which this is a system, this latter one, it's a mining system. And we question this system quite a bit because it's part of a process of labor, uh, flexible conditions. Why do we want to opt for this type of mining activity? We're going to exclude from this dialogue gold because gold has different characteristics and we're going to concentrate in this mine that I'm going to introduce here, which is uh, similar to what happens with uh, silver uh, and zinc. In this type of uh, mining, such as uh, tin mining, they use up to one third of uh, mineral production in Bolivia, but up to 90% of labor of uh, mineral extraction in Bolivia. And why is it important to focus on this type of mining activities? Because 30 years ago, these cooperatives came about as a response to the crisis of the beginning of the 80s, and this was an international crisis with uh, mineral uh, prices. Many people uh, are left unemployed, and uh, then they are renting to this group of miners the mines. Uh, and the main characteristic is that uh, cooperatives are groups of families of uh, miners who are renting from the state those mines who are not cost effective for this type of uh, technical mining activities. And it is within this framework that from the 80s, we see the appearance of the first cooperatives and uh, except for gold, there are more or less 100 cooperatives in Bolivia, grouping more or less 70,000, 80,000 people. So the study that I'm going to present here, in this case, is very similar and repetitive in all the mining operations which take place in Bolivia. Uh, as I was saying, is uh, uh, silver and tin mainly.
As I was saying, there are three types of mining operators, state, uh, cooperatives, and private, also lead in this case. The most important thing I was mentioning before, it's an informal system formalized by the Bolivian state in order to uh, make working conditions more flexible. Mining cooperatives are not regulated, and we're thinking about 70,000, 80,000 workers by law. In Bolivia, we have a labor law, which dates from uh, 1947. It's not regulated by this legislation, but by uh, legislation or law of cooperatives, which states that this system uh, there is not going to be a relationship be to, between employer and employee. So the minor is at the same time employee and employer. So the labor legislation deciding the working hours and extra, extra hours, labor costs, uh, uh, does not apply to this system of cooperative. So this is the main element because as we will see, this creates huge problems. And at the same time, it also generates great savings to other actors of this uh, mineral chain. As I was saying, a second element, besides the fact that they are not under the Bolivian uh, labor law, is that none of these cooperatives uh, has the ownership of the mines. The ownership belongs to the Bolivian state, and they rent them, they lend them to the cooperatives, 1% of the gross value of production before taxes, before expenses. So, in practice, this 1% is equivalent to 2 3% of the net value uh, which should be generated. So, here is the first issue, and this will mean, as you see in the metis, since they are not the owners, they don't have either the capacity to borrow money, they don't have the capacity to plan their future, to plan the mining activities, because they are not subject to credit, they do not have the ownership of the mines. As I was saying, in theory, in all the cooperatives, according to the legislation, uh, Bolivian generation legislation of cooperatives, there is a sense of uh, equality of duties and rights of miners. But it's only in one sense, because those miners who are older than 40 and are very familiar with the mines, and the youngest ones uh, go into those spaces where there is very little mineral, so there is no equality or oh, transparent equity as far as the activity. Another fundamental area, these are exhausted mines, so miners are always looking for the mineral, and when a miner finds a mineral, for example, you are able to find the mineral, uh, you become like the owner of that space, and everybody else are groups made by four or five people called quadrillas, and they are distributed according to what you decide. Therefore, since there is no labor legislation and there is no authority uh, where they can claim the rights because the cooperatives are managed by an assembly of members where decisions are made. So this assembly made by different members are managed by the oldest miners, those who have more knowledge, those who have rich contacts with the state. So. Uh, in brackets, let's say, they uh, become like patrons without being that, without being employers. So the relationship of the different income are not defined by the working hours. Working hours equals wage, but depending on the productive effort they make, and this productive effort is defined by the international quotation of minerals. And now where tin and silver are so high, they're working for 10, 12, 14 hours in order to capture as much mineral as possible from the mines. And this is something that has to be compensated with the selling capacity they have. Why? Because the Bolivian legislation, as far as tin, for example, uh, states, I think we lost the speaker. Oh, okay. A state one and a private one. And miners have to sell inevitably 
to them. I think we lost the speaker. Sorry. Now, okay, he's back. He's back. Uh, my apologies. Can you can you hear me? I have in a rural area and I have uh, some issues with my connection. As I was saying, their production has to go through a trading process which escapes their control or is controlled under someone else in the case of tin. And for other minerals, it's controlled by companies that we call traders. And these traders are the ones that export the minerals because the cooperatives by themselves don't have exporting capacity, mineral exporting capacity, because their production uh, volumes are not big and neither do they have contact with the market. So this is an occasional uh, contact and they become employees of the traders. And those employees who are employees without any commitment. Therefore, this situation makes them work according to the labor law, eight hours, 40 hours per week, and on average they work 12 hours, six days a week. So there's a, an excess of uh, labor effort, and it's the opposite to monopoly. And since these conditions exist, it means that about 30% of the labor basic costs which should be paid by the employer, employer sorry, such as medical insurance, uh, also extras and termination of contract is not paid by anyone. So this is a cost that is flowing and this is making even cheaper the value of the mineral they sell. And this is the main idea I wanted to communicate here. The mineral extracted on Bolivia, from Bolivian mines uh, following this system uh, is coming while well, the traders and also uh, companies take them to other corners of the world. Uh, they are in this part of the chain and they are avoiding paying 30% of the value of the wage of each one of the workers, which means that there are many problems. For example, in the case of women, just to focus on other parameters, we have women working there in Bolivia. The employer has to pay 15 uh, wages when a woman is pregnant, and she has to allow permission for 90 days before and after. Doesn't happen with the cooperatives, so minors, this value income, 30%, sorry, at least per month, they avoid spending it and they avoid using personal protection equipment, uh, Pulmosan it's called, which is uh, like a mask with a filter in order to prevent metal dust from being uh, inhaled. They buy uh, bad quality of uh, equipment and they take on administrative cost and they avoid this way costs which are not direct for protection and these indirect costs are to safety and health in job in the job and environmental cost so we have problems with people and also in their environment and the environment they're working so this is what i wanted to mention this cooperative system it's a labor flexible system which basically the only thing it does is to gather people so they can work in a specific space and in some case helping them to sell the minerals and to reduce uh, conflicts which can come up inside the mine. Since they do not have uh, any technical process inside the mine, it's possible for the miner to be working in a highly mineralized uh, area and other miners can occupy or want to occupy this uh, space. And in this case, in the case of the mines, they're all equal, there are no tips either, so uh, we have seen conflicts for working spaces. So the cooperative manages and tries to reduce these conflicts. In the cases I'm showing the, in this particular image, what happens is that there are consequences to this system. What you see, for example, 
its mind and how the ceiling is falling apart. And this is the structure, and nobody is repairing this because this will represent high cost. We have made the survey in the mines, and they showed that in the last five years, 80% of miners of uh, mine made by 250 workers have suffered injuries in the head, back, or feet. The year before, 10%, 40% work more than six hours, uh, 12 hours a day, and this has serious consequences on their health. The maintenance of the mines, since they are not the owners of the mines, these mines do not have any ventilation. 95% of miners are exposed to gases which cause, uh, similar to the ones uh, issued by diesel motors, there is no ventilation inside the mines, and there is no ventilation for the gas and dust produced by the rock perforation. And one very serious problem is that in order to perforate the rock, you need a lot of water. And water has to reach the mines through connection systems. And this is quite expensive. And they avoid doing this. And they avoid this, but it has serious consequences on their health. We don't have a precise data because uh, the person in charge of uh, this is not giving us enough data, but the amount of workers who have uh, left the mine due to silicosis, which is the lung deterioration uh, due to mineralized dust, because they inhale metallized uh, dust. Two minutes, Jesus. Okay. I'm going to summarize very quickly then. So there are problems of rheumatism, there are many injuries in the back, and all this happens because they are drastically reducing their cost. And in the end, what happens is that they reduce cost in order to increase their income, which causes uh, unsafe uh, working conditions and highly dangerous. And this is what I want to comment on. Uh, the problem it's a local and global problem. And these details that I'm showing, uh, dangerous mining activities, is not contemplated in the price structure of the minerals. And we can escalate and thinking about electronic uh, products. And it is not foreseen within the scale of the price of the minerals because there is a lot of speculation. Those elements which should be part of the process. Neither do we see a structure of the different externalities, life expectancy of these people and these external elements are not part of the cost of raw material. And finally, the most serious problem is that what's happening in Bolivia, in Africa, in Asia, the state is promoting labor flexibility in order to reduce prices. And these are the consequences. And in Bolivia, this labor flexibility means that these activities do not have any control about the market and also about the markets selling uh, the minerals, which shows them in a defendless state, generating many resources, and these resources do not necessarily remain in the family. And there is a serious deterioration uh, in people as a consequence of the mining activity. Thank you very much, Jesus. I was thinking when I was listening to you about the contradiction about the good press and the beauty that we see here in Catalonia. And uh, it is true. Here in Catalonia, we have good tools with uh, working dynamics and the negative consequences of this cooperatism. Uh, we will probably not call it like that. Uh, in Bolivian mines. So in order to, well, I was thinking that we should always uh, look and focus on not only what we 
think and the way we want to express it, but to listen to what other people have to say. And that's all. I'm going to give the floor now to the second participation of today's roundtable, who is Diego Martin. And Diego Martin works in the unit of economic transition of the European Office of Environment, Master in International Development by the University of Care, the study of international School of International Studies of Brussels. He's leader in raw material analyzing green and digital uh, transition from an environmental global perspective. Co-author of the report published together with Friends of Earth, which is called Green Mind Melanzanine, uh, the case for cutting in uh, EU resource consumption and case to reduce consumption of resources in the European Union. Diego, you have the floor and thank you very much for being here with us. With us. Hello. Thank you very much for inviting me. I have many, many slides, so I will rush a little bit. But I also have a lot of information, so of course I can give it to you so you can continue with your research. We are going through some time in recent human history, which is very interesting. And there have been many energy transition in the history of humanity. And recently, the energy transition is called the green energy transition, which uh, requires many more minerals in a sense that uh, they have never been extracted in the past. And we're going to have more details later on. So let me provide a little bit of background. The European Union is going through a crisis. It's very anxious for the moment uh, in order to recover these uh, raw materials due to the digital transition and green transition, which is under the Green Treaty back in 2019 with the von der Leyen Commission. And the COVID crisis made some impact on the supply chain, creating a scarcity in the market and restriction to export. And uh, this provision chain Europe is very uh, dependent, 93% of magnesium uh, from uh, China, 98% of uh, borate is also from Turkey, and 85% of niobium from Brazil uh, in construction and also in the car industry, transportation industry. Not only the European Union has these problems, but the United States, Canada, Australia, Japan, South Korea, and China are also trying to have their own strategies in order to collect uh, these materials. And um, lately, Russia's invasion caused even more uh, problem for the European Union because since I'm going to speak a bit more about this, many of these resources uh, come from Russia. Next slide, please. I also want to play some background in order for you to understand. On the left, we see the planetary limits, and often uh, many are related to climate change. If you can take at the climate change on top, you will see that, of course, we have uh, gone over the planetary limit. But if you take a look at the biosphere integrity and new identities that were discovered last year, we have gone uh, beyond five of these planetary limits. So pollution, we have uh, many microplastics in our bodies from uh, chemical origin, uh, PFAS, forever chemicals which, of course, we are not able to digest. And climate change right now is the focus of our politicians. But we can see, of course, that there are other worries. 
And I also want to show you very quickly the planetary turning points, which are very important, because basically, if one of these turning points that now scientists are saying that uh, we have gone uh, through some of them, or we are going through some of them, it's causing like a domino effect. If uh, we are already going through a turning point, the rest will fall and will change our society the way we know it, the way we grow food, uh, climate change is going to get worse, etc. And uh, this is just what I wanted to show you so you can take a look at this. So going back to my previous idea about the crisis or the anxiety mentioned by the European Union, on the left, we see many of the countries in where these resources of raw materials come from. China has most of the pie of these materials, uh, rare uh, substances, rare uh, materials. And here, uh, the need to meet the, our objectives requires uh, 60 times more lithium by 2050, which means basically levels of uh, chemical extraction. Next, please. OK, and here we see how we have, well, uh, the way the mining industry is placed. The mining industry, if I ask the question here, most of the people will think that mining industry, and our colleague Jesus has mentioned it, has mentioned in the cooperative sector, but the mining industry, the formal one, has many environmental impacts. We have listened about the mining processes in Congo, in Brazil, uh, the Tajo Abierto mining activities. So there is some social uh, idea that it has a very negative image. So what does the industry do? It's trying to co-opt this message of uh, what is required from the climate change and in reality this is something that should be done 30 years ago in order to avoid serious problems but here we are 2023 and the thing is that the mining industry now is trying to uh, show and launch this message so here empower action for climate action is from the world bank uh, smart climate smart mining climate smart mining in Spanish, he's repeating. And here we see also uh, mining with nature, which now uh, mining sector is trying to say that not only in the past, yes, we have destroyed biodiversity, but now we can create it. So basically, we are being told that they can increase the level of biodiversity in a mineral project. And also, uh, to your right, you see uh, uh, digging for climate change. So this is the reminding of sustainable mining. Next, please. And now a little bit more about the demand of raw materials. Here we have a report, a foresight report. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, it's... Um, I'm using words in English here, but well, we have a report here that was um, published by the European Union, and there's the uh, less ambitious scenario and the more ambitious scenario. And here we see the level of dysprosium and lithium and cobalt and graphite, and they're very high. We're breaching levels that were never before extracted. And in the case of dystrophia and uh, neodymium, these rare materials, there's no mining in the planet that could extract these minerals as raw material. It always comes from other kind of materials. So if the primary material does not have a good price at the international market, it will not be so exploited by mining which leads these rare earth, these rare materials to, to reduce their levels. So that's why it's so difficult. And well, it's so difficult basically to foresee the level of uh, rare materials that are going to be extracted in the future. 
So, under this case, we produced a report two years ago, and now I'm not going to dwell on this because things have changed a lot since when we really wrote these reports. But we wanted to challenge this narrative that we are hearing in Brussels. And of course, Brussels dominates the European Union and all these legislations are going to go to member states. So we were communicating with other social movements against mining in Europe, and we were starting to get to understand how mining is behaving here in Europe, where it's supposed to behave much better than elsewhere. So we found out that there's a lot of things said about mining and extraction of materials, but we do not talk that much about consumption and production. These materials are rare. And they, well, not only are they rare, because, you know, if you, you see them located in the world, well, actually, they're not that rare. Lithium exists everywhere. But in order to find those materials in such a concentration that makes them economically viable for them to be extracted, well, it depends very much on geography. So that's why they're called rare materials, but they're, you know, not so rare if you want. It's just difficult to extract them from the soil. So, well, the European Union is very much dependent on other countries. And in Europe, even though we're 6 to 7% of the worldwide population, we consume 30 percent of primary materials, which means that only 70 percent is left for the rest of the world. And in terms of exponential or potential extraction in the world, Dr. Alicia Velero tells us that, well, in the future, how much will we need to extract to keep with our previous levels? You know, it means that in the following years, we will have to extract 0.5 times more gold than in the history of humanity. But in the case of lithium, we're talking about twice as much than it was extracted in the history of humankind. And in the case of copper, in the next 80 years, we may reach the limit of copper that can be extracted, which leads to an intergenerational problem of justice. Because, well, the future generations that are not yet here, in 100 years, they will need these materials for technologies that are not yet conceived. So if we are extracting this today, well, this is going to lead to a lot of waste for the next generations. And I would like to state this point. And the problem does not only revolve around extraction, it's also waste. And in the European Union, even though, well, you may not know that there's a mining industry here that is not that large, but it exists here in Spain and Finland and Sweden. And Sweden. <clears throat> Mining waste are the second largest kind of waste in Europe. Even though mining is not that large here, but mining waste, well, mining produces a lot of waste, and this waste is the second kind of waste in Europe that we find. And in spite of the directives to protect nature in Europe, we still have problems to protect our biodiverse areas. 70% of species and 80% of habitats are in a non-favorable situation of preservation. Now, with this mining that is going to happen in Europe, well, they want to place this and exploit these mines in biodiverse areas in the Network 2000 Nature. And according to the directive, you can extract uh, materials from mines. But the problem is that today's mines in Europe are not metal mines. 
Oh, the extension that is now needed for for turbines and for solar panels. Well, they require rare earth and uh, cobalt and so on. So European companies are moving to diverse areas because Europe is a very small region. It's not like New Zealand or Canada or or, or the US where uh, a mine can be really far away from the capital. And I'm going to go faster. So we see here the level of consumption and we analyzed it in our report. And this is some kind of projection and numbers are difficult to get because there are member countries which do not declare the level of consumption of their countries or maybe they report it but there, you know, sometimes there are inconsistencies. One year they report and not the next, so there may be gaps. Here in the right hand side, we see the total production of metal. And how the level of consumption in the world is going to increase exponentially in 2020. The extraction or, uh, well, manufactured products have exceeded the way of biomass, which means that we human beings have built more, more in weight than what exists. So we see the European Union which wants to have more mines in the European Union and here are some mines that are trying to be exploited and we can see, well we can see here in Spain for example or we can see in, in many other areas and there may be even more mines. Here we have a protest here in Costa de Barroso in Portugal and uh, they were protesting about uh, lithium mine. And now here, if you want to do more research, here's Spain. And we're talking a lot about uh, human rights and environmental rights. And I think, you know, I think that European people, well, they think that they're the kings of the world and uh, here in Spain, for example, there are many cases which have been already uh, uploaded in the MINOB web page. I'm not going to dwell now in the impacts of uh, this cooperative mining, but there's a foundation which does not exist anymore. Unfortunately, they lost their funds, but there's the um, Responsible Mining Foundation and there's this index that appears every two years. And in 2022, they found out that no mine in the world would reach the right level to state that it's a good environmental and social mine. So there are certain companies which may um, be leading the ranking and uh, there are projects that are better than others but no mine reaches a standard in terms of environmental and uh, and social rights so when somebody says what is green mining well you know in evidence it does not exist i mean it's something that we would like for the future but so far green mining does not exist next slide please this is just for your research. In a couple of weeks, there's going to be this European strategy to be published. The European Union has analyzed six different important areas for identification in order to improve the situation of Europe, which does not have those resources. And as I said, there's a very low diversification in supplies 
in the European Union. I mean, there's dependency, there's a lack of certain supplies, there's the non-exploited potential in the European Union. You know, a mine takes 10 to, to, to 20 years to to, to, to reach uh, certain status and uh, the European Union wants to do that three times faster which means that mining is going to keep increasing. <clears throat> there is supposedly a lack of funding but if you talk to mining uh, companies they say that it's actually not a lack of funding but a lack of permits which are the problem. And well then there's this fear that certain countries may not have the right resources like um, certain countries will not have enough resources so the European Union wants to have a single market in order to buffer any kind of clashes and of course obviously The uh, trade unions did not, did not recognize all of this and they want to improve the situation. And I, if I would like to, to go to the last slide and then I close, because I do have a lot of recommendations at the short term, really. You're, of course, you're going to have many recommendations everywhere and they're not so different. But what is different is that the due diligence, there's a due diligence law which is being discussed right now and this is a very good tool but it's not going to solve the problem because the problem is that economies are growing by two to three percent every year which means two to three times percent more uh, natural resources and energy because all these things are linked the three things are very much aligned so what do we need we need to move towards a rational use of resources which means that this pyramid which is inspired by another very well-known pyramid means that first of all we need sufficiency and substitution which are crucial for example in the case of sodium this is a battery that can coexist very well with lithium but they don't we don't have the right financial infrastructure for sodium as we do have for lithium because investors do know about lithium and they do invest in that but sodium nobody knows about it and sodium is very much compatible and sodium is much better for the environment it's not so good in terms of efficiency as lithium but it's very competitive now we're moving towards a circular and efficient society we're talking about circular economy but circular economy does have problems as well and lastly we can extract those materials which are needed because if I could show you this pyramid I mean at the at the moment this pyramid for the European Union is upside down first of all we extract as much as possible and then we see what we need for instance in the piece of legislation which is coming up in two weeks a big fear that we have is that the uh, recycling sector which we do need in Europe is very low I mean lithium is just a one percent recycle and we are afraid that recycling will be perceived as circular economy and it is not I mean there's use reuse elimination of raw materials and this is much better than recycling recycling keeps polluting I mean of course it's much better than just disposal of raw material but but in circular economy there are other stages that have to be considered but well anyway there's no time but if you do have any questions here I am thank you very much do you have any time for questions
estamos a intentar ir rapidito también con estas. We're going to try to, to be quick with the questions. How do you see the world in 2030 with the 2030 agenda? And what about the natural resources? I remember, David, there's a journalist who was killed in Burkina Faso and he made a documentary of, on cobalt. We're sorry because the volume is really very low. We, we could hardly hear the question. We're going to ask all the questions at the same time. My question is for both speakers. Bolivia is a country with the highest number of uh, supplies in the world um, apart from sub-Saharan Africa. And I don't know what you may tell us about the perspective there in Bolivia. Thank you very much for the presentations. My question is, what is the solution if there's no green mining? And it seems that all mines do have a very large social impact. So what is the alternative to get to the minerals that we need to, to perform a green and fair transition from a social point of view? I'm going to answer the first and the last question because they are very much related. Basically, the 2030 agenda, well, unfortunately, it does not consider sufficiency whatsoever. It just believes in uh, economic growth or in cleaner, if you want, economic growth, or greener economic growth. But the problem with green growth is that it requires a lot of raw materials. I mean, what I have talked about is green growth. But in a future world, in the future world followed by the Agenda 2030, well, this is better than nothing, of course. There are good things indeed. There's a women's rights, there's a, a world with no starvation, which is totally impossible with a green growth, let me say. But it does not really challenge the level of consumption and production, which is the problem, the, the, the most serious problem. So now if you could move to my 19th slide, the solution is basically short and long term. Short term, well, we need a due diligence that includes the mining sector. And we need people to have access to their liability. And uh, they need to have access to courts and they need this due diligence to be recognized. But we also need to move towards the goal of reducing raw materials. Uh, because we do have this goal regarding CO2 emissions. We say 55% by 2030 for CO2 emissions. But, you know, well, climate change is only one of the nine limitations to the planet. So if we do have this goal of 55% by 2030 in terms of CO2 reductions, why don't we have this for raw materials? I mean, by 2030, we should have an objective of reduction of 30%, let's say, or uh, for 2030, or 45% for two hundred for 2045 and 50% for 2050. In terms of raw materials for the European Union, which means that every country, like Spain, Lithuania, Letonia, etc., they would have different objectives because the level of consumption is different between countries. And we need to be fair. And that's why we need data. 
It's very important that countries perform their research about how much raw material is getting to their countries, and they need to report this information so that we can have more adjusted and correct targets, because a lot is reported regard, regarding CO2 emissions, but not that much regarding raw materials. So the goal of 50 or 60% is very important for us for 2050. Now let's give the floor to Jesus for an answer. Well, you were talking about the perspective of lithium. We're researching on that as well. And as you may know, all mineral resources in Bolivia are considered strategic and they're administered by the central state. Bolivia has undergone two processes in the last 10 years when it comes to trying to extract lithium. There was evaporation extraction, and this was approved in the last eight years. But it's been determined that this extraction process is very slow which is in contradiction with the green transition and the great worldwide demand of lithium. And now in the last years, we have moved to a direct extraction of lithium. And in both cases, the standards that are generated and the regulations that are generated for lithium extraction depend very much on other actors. We did have in 2018 a contract with a German company who was in charge of lithium extraction, but because of political issues, this did not move on. And right now we have a contract and an agreement with a Chinese company. And the perspective is that by 2025, Bolivia will be producing 65,000 metric tons of lithium. And this is the perspective. But the problem, however, is that in both processes, it was not only uh, or, or not that much about producing raw material. And actually, with that failed contract with the German company, Axisa, uh, well, it failed, and uh, but with the Chinese company, we succeeded. So the Bolivian government decided to stop being a producer of raw materials and to start producing input of lithium. So this sovereignty national policy for a greater industrialization of lithium is not happening because there are technological differences and the North is not ready to provide this transition because they would lose the control over these raw materials. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. Well, I think that now we're going to ask for a few more minutes because in Alternativa, well, regarding lithium, we're producing a documentary about lithium extraction and the consequences it has in indigenous communities in um, salt areas in Argentina, not in Bolivia, but in Argentina. In Argentina, there's lithium extraction for many decades, also in Chile, and we are now witnessing the effects. So I just wanted to say that we will have a documentary in the next month. And actually, uh, well, this was actually what I wanted to tell you. Thank you very much to the audience, to Jesus, to Daniel for their interventions, also the previous speakers with their interesting interventions. And now we're going to show these three minutes about lithium extraction, and then we close. Thank you very much.
baterías de litio utilizadas por los nuevos dispositivos son las que más energía renovable acumulan y ayudan a combatir el cambio climático. Respetamos las normativas ambientales y estamos en constante diálogo con las comunidades originarias de nuestra puna, garantizando su participación en todos los procesos. Jujuy, provincia verde. La empresa y el gobierno entraron como si nada, digamos. No se respetaron los derechos de los pueblos en caso... Nosotros decíamos desde la consulta previa, que son este, antes de entrar a una casa, a un hogar, Uh, tanto la empresa el gobierno tiene que pedir permiso. ¿Vino Así. la empresa en algún momento a pedir? Que... No, nos mandan folleto que he escrito en chino, no, no lo entendemos. Estamos en nosotros, nos corresponde, estamos en nuestras tierras de ancestral sí, sí. que dejaron nuestros abuelos. Sí. Creo que tenemos derecho. Ellos tenían en el salar dos arroyos. El trapiche colapsó, porque la demanda de agua dulce de la, de la minera lo llevó a quedarse sin reserva hídrica y ahora quieren canalizar el, de, el río de los patos. La comunidad de, de seres silvestres, tanto animales como plantas, está languideciendo lentamente e incluso, digamos, los habitantes humanos que tenían una vida pastoril productiva, eficiente y próspera, eh, digamos, se han reducido su ganado a nivel de la subsistencia. ¿Y a dónde tenemos la vicuña nosotros? La ¿Sí? Baja. ¿Sí? Entonces nos estamos contradiciendo nosotros mismos. Si algunos hermanos plantean todavía aceptar los emprendimientos de las empresas mineras, en este caso no en una simple empresa, son megas empresas que nos van a saquear el agua, nos van a dejar la contaminación. Ustedes han visto el territorio que ellos solicitan, es toda la cuenca. No, no han tenido en cuenta nuestro territorio, el asentamiento poblacional, los pastoreos. Ese es el trabajo que nosotros hemos venido luchando hace mucho tiempo, la conservación del territorio. ¿Ve? Así son los gobiernos, te engañan, te vienen, te engañan. Ahora, para sacar este hace va a ser, va a venir a engañar. ¡Ay, ay, hermanos! ¡Ay, ay, ay! ¡No al litio! ¡No al litio! ¡Y aquí vamos, no al litio! ¡No al litio! No, no. Bé, moltes gràcies a l'Anç, hem quedat amb les ganes de, de veure aquest documental sencer. Eh, ja el veurem eh, quan tinguem l'oportunitat. Abans de marxar i d'acomiadar-nos ja d'això... Before leaving, I would like to give you some information to remind you that here you have the information about the project to join the allegations uh, against the petition uh, to non to the mine in Cañaveral. Remember that you have the information here. You can sign in. And the last panel of uh, the, so the Social Mobile Congress, well, I would like to thank you for having been here the whole afternoon, evening. Thanks to all participants, to our speakers, to the chair people, to all those people following have online and all the stakeholders that have made this mobile social um, congress thanks to the Patty Manning and the Barcelona City Council. This uh, event is organized by the um, Fair Electronic Campaign of CETEM that works to denounce the, some of the activities of the electronic sector. We raise awareness, awareness we um, carry on advocacy uh, activities. You can visit you can our visit website, CETEM website CETEM. Where you, you can follow CETEM uh, through social media. You'll find all the information about the campaign CETEM is carried out. And remember that uh, this doesn't end here. This is the first um, day of the Mobile Social Congress, but we continue tomorrow and the day after. And tomorrow, we will continue with a Cine Forum where we will broadcast a live documentary about electronic waste and there will be um, a chat after a while, a conference with an expert. This will take place here at Patty Manning at 6.30 and 
it will be only in person, not uh, virtually. And on Saturday at the San Agustin convent from 12 to 2, we, there will be an um, open event. There will be um, games for that are um, socially responsible for the small ones and young ones. So we are feel free to tweet about the event and I hope to see you tomorrow and the day after. Thank you.